Hello and welcome back to the Zwift Grand Prix. Welcome back as it's our quest to find the ultimate Zwift team. Happy New Year to everybody around the world who's joining us to catch the last two rounds of the second edition of the Zwift Grand Prix. My name's Jez Cox and I'm pleased to say I have with me Matt Stevens. Matt, nice to be joining on the mic together for the first time in this Zwift Grand Prix this season. How are you, Matt? Indeed. No, Jez. Yeah, Happy New Year as well. Yeah, thanks, matey. And Happy New Year to everybody out there as well. It is good to be back and great to be working alongside you because this is a pretty special race, isn't it? Um, especially special for the ones that are racing it. We're in the comfort of our respective studios, but this is the longest Zwift race that I've ever commentated on. I think it's the longest in Zwift Grand Prix prehistory. So there's going to be a lot of firsts today. But one thing's for sure, this is going to be massively entertaining. Jez, I cannot wait. Yeah, we've been through those uh, ZRL supported weeks where we've been splitting the men's races and the women's races apart. Tonight and next Thursday night, we go back to having the men's and women's races together. It's the epic points, epic points race, I should say, this week. And we finish the whole Zwift Grand Prix next week with the Points Hunter, which, of course, is what we started with. The difference between the two, of course, is that in the Points Hunter, every time you score a point, you are out. Even if you just score the one point, you're out. Tonight, though, all the points count. And crucially, for all the finishers, as long as they finish within the time cutoff, their points will count too. So an awful lot of pressure on the 80 men and the 80 women who are locked and loaded, ready to see if they can move their team up. Abus Synergy lead for the men, Coalition Alpha lead for the women. But all three top threes could shuffle, Matt, couldn't they? Because it's close enough between them at the top and so many points up for grabs tonight. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of points to say out out on the road, as you described. It is a points race, and um, quite rightly, the epic points race for the reasons we just talked about. Um, as well as those 70 kilometres in distance, we've got just under a thousand metres of elevation as well with those four ascents of Box Hill. But you're quite right. Yeah, it's uh, we, this is the penultimate round. We've got one more round to come after this next week on the 18th. And the win is still up for grabs. And when you look at previous Zwift Grand Prix uh, over the years, we've had some quite dominant teams and there's quite often a, a scuffle, a fight for the more minor placings. But this is still wide open. And today, a completely different proposition. Lots of points available out on the road. 150 points uh, each ascent of Box Hill. So it is going to be intriguing, interesting and informative yeah. at how the different teams set about tackling this this particular course. It's worth pointing out that the men actually started their, let's call it 70k, it's 69.7k, let's call it 70 to be fair. They started just about three or four minutes ago. Now let's have a look at what they've actually got to do. As Matt has mentioned, at the top of each ascent of Box Hill, because we're in London, we're riding the... Um, uh, PRL half course, the Prudential Ride London half course, which is due to mimic effectively the course of the Prudential Ride London. But effectively what we're doing is we get a, get rid of South London completely and move Box Hill and Surrey up. So sorry to the South London, as I was born north of the river, so I can say that. But it brings into play, of course, that fantastic, iconic climb of Box Hill. On top of that, each time, as Matt has mentioned, there are points for the first five riders across the line, 150, 75, 50, 40 and 35 in that order. And then crucially, we've got a draft power up, which is available as they go back through the start line every time north of the river and again on top of that point. Matt, can you just remind us what the draft power up does? I know it gives you 40 seconds. So just I always confuse myself. Is it 40 seconds that you get a better draft from the person in front or you draft the person behind you better for 40 seconds? How does it how does it work? It's. It's, it's better when he's sat in the wheels using the, the draft power up. Right. Um, if you haven't got the aero power up, the next best one in a sprint, for example, you, you get um, basically your CDA drops and you, you, the, this increased draft. We've played around with the functionality of this over the last few years. So I think we've, we've got it's it's a good one, but um, you can also use it to have a little bit of rest. If you're suffering over on, on a flat section, you're really on the edge. Quite often you'll use this particular power up just to take the edge off a little bit rather than mm. using it to go on the attack. So it's, I would say it's more of a defensive power up, really. And on a course like this, especially given the distance we've got, conservation of energy is going to be key. You're going to need to use this, maybe not necessarily on the cl climb because you're moving at a lower speed. On, the, on, on Box Hill. So maybe you'd use it on another part of the course. But as you can see, there are multiple opportunities. You get the power up opportunity through the archway on the flat in London, then over the top of the climb. But Fantastic. basically, it well, reduces it's, um, your, your. Yeah. Well, we, we, we'll look to see how it's used because there's enough of them being handed out, two per lap on each of those four laps. 
Uh, folks at home, you please please to know it's not just Matt and I waffling along. We've got a real expert. Of course, he's been with us uh, on and off throughout this with Grand Prix, sometimes as a rider, sometimes as a team manager, but today as our pundit in the hot seat. Nathan Guerra, welcome back. Happy New Year, mate. Happy New Year. Good to hear from you guys and good to uh, be with the broadcast today. Now, Nathan, I'm a hard-nosed journalist. I'm going to fire a really nasty one at you right at the beginning. Why are you not riding? <laughs> it's a good question. Well, <laughs> uh, I did pick up a little bit of illness over the break. I haven't been able to ride my bike much for probably almost weeks now. So uh, we're doing the next best thing, which is watching some bike racing and uh, maybe cheering Gabby on next to me as she gets going a little bit later. Fantastic. I see you've taken your jacket back off. Just before we came on air, folks, I can tell you Nathan said it's getting a little bit cold in there where he is because he's in the pain cave with his wife, Gabby, who is going to be racing, of course, in the women's race, which comes up after this. The races, by the way, folks, will overlap ever so slightly, but we'll uh, bring you up to speed with what's happened so far in both cases. And we'll be checking back in with you, Nathan, as we go as well. And, and fingers crossed from all of us who are watching, because I know you've got a lot of fans out there, particularly in the Zwift community. Fingers crossed that you're healthy and well for that final race. Around the uh, the points hunter although that's such a horrific race you might not want to be my friend <laughs> yeah i'm excited to get going again so we'll get on the bike as quickly as you can and i'll uh, definitely be grabbing my jacket as i'm literally watching the temperature drop by the minute so uh we're getting it nice and cool in here for gabby's race but the men are heating it up now out on course fantastic thanks nathan we'll check back in with you shortly let's have a look if we can at how the points stand overall let's get a rundown of the teams in the men Aber synergy leading and they have a an 18 point lead which is a pretty comfortable buffer but when you consider how many points are out there tonight they could slip from there that's for sure next esports powered by ensured are in second coalition alpha the men's version of what is our leading women's team are in third, so they'll be looking to see if they can move up maybe and join the illustrious company of their women's team at the very top. Let's see. Wahoo Lacol sit in fourth on 91 points. Toyota Elite E-Cycling in fifth. Hexagon, the French team in sixth. Beast Mode, uh, Beast Mode powered by Rose. Had that brilliant performance in the team time trial, of course, there in seventh. Eighth place for Team Movistar. Very equal with their women, really, sitting mid-table in both of our uh, men's and women's series. Saris Nopins in ninth place. BL13 presented by Level Velo. I think my favourite jersey amongst the men's teams. That kind of sunset orangey gold there in tenth. 11th place is one of the oldest teams in pro Zwift racing, I guess. Team Swedish Zwifters, they're on 38 points. The French team, Food de Poncheurs Coalition in 12th. Restart, powered by Alex Co. Coaching in 13th. Team Castelli, powered by Elite. Uh, Nathan's team in 14th. Deepak Elite in 15th. And Primor have scored points, unlike, unfortunately, their female counterpart. They're on four points. They sit at the bottom looking to move up with Deepak. That's how things stand after five of the seven rounds, two rounds to go. And uh, it'll, be, it'll be fascinating to see how things can close up. Let's have a look at the riders these teams bring to us, though, shall we, Matt? Indeed. Well, uh, we're in reverse order here, so another opportunity for us to look at the rankings in a little bit more detail. Of course, Primor uh, races without borders. As you said, they're already off the mark in terms of points, but given the uh, the points distribution, there is an opportunity over the next two rounds to move off bottom spot. So uh, let's hope they can do that um, uh, without getting too biased, of course. They have uh, three Irish runners in their team, Miller, Mullen and Ryan. Deepak Elite, I can actually say without giving too much away, there's a rider up the road at the moment for Deepak Elite. More about that in a little hey. bit. But we've got Tom Burns, De Evola, McKee, Morgan and Pettinger. Team Castelli. Uh, normally, of course, Nathan would be riding for this, but uh, but he's, uh, I guess, in DS role today. Team Castelli looking to, I think, to move above 14th place and then restart there, currently in 13th. Uh, maybe look out for Rob Wood from Great Britain for them today. Hmm. Uh, Foudre Poncheurs Coalition, I'll remind people, as I said right the way back in October, that a Foudre is a large wooden vat used for holding wine. It comes from the Rhone Valley, so let's hope they get a chance to use their Foudre, the Punchers. They want to move up, definitely, from their 12th place. But they are building their last point scores, 1 point, 2 point, 6 points and 12 points. Think about it like that, it's brilliant. They are constantly on the move. Let's see if the Poncheurs can continue to move up. In 11th place, Team Swedish. Um, 
very consistent, but still sitting at the moment as a mid-pack team. But you'd expect that to be their con consistent calling card, being such an experienced team as well. BL13, that jersey again, as I mentioned, definitely my favourite. Sitting in 10th, they're gradually slipping. Their last point scores have gone 12, 10, 8 and 8. So they need to steady the ship, that team tonight, perhaps. Daryl Carter will be trying to do exactly that. Saris Nopin sitting in ninth place, the All-American team this evening looking to overcome a bit of a bad dip at the last round where they scored no points, very unlike them. They're normally scoring 12 to 14 or so points. They scored nothing in the last round, so they need to pull their socks up, the Americans, tonight. Indeed, well, you heard it here first. Pull their socks up. There's uh, stern words coming from Jez Cox there. But <laughs> well, yeah. I, think I think they'll be in agreement. I certainly I, think they will. It's, not, it's certainly not I, I heard someone to. say... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh no, definitely. Yeah, they'll be they'll be looking to move up. But Mobistar, solid yeah. there in eighth place as well. But they have such a good team: Harvey Gledners, Jimmy Kershaw, Kershaw, a very very good climber as well, an explosive rider, and Vidar Bell. And again, as we move into these top ten teams, there's not a lot of slack in these teams at all. Beast mode, powered by Rose, are looking uh, good as well. Look out for Christoph Thiem, and um, in the all German lineup there, Hexagon. For me, you know. The Exagon, across on the women's side as well, Exagon on the women's side, they're sat in third. But Exagon, for me, have been one of the teams, a revelation of this season. They're a new team, well, new kids on the block, as it were, and they have uh, they have impressed. Uh, watch out for Rick Ottomar, I think. He'd be the standout rider for them. But it's all about the team, of course. It's not just about one rider here. It's all about everybody pulling together as best they can. And then, of course, a Toyota Elite, currently sat in fifth place, and they've got a strong lineup too. Martin Martins, of course, is uh, probably their most preeminent rider with wins on the board already this year. Next up into the top four, Wahoo Lakol, who this evening are led by Howell Davies, of course, who was our expert in picture expert just a few weeks ago before Christmas. He's an old teammate of mine, Howell, an old racing adversary of mine, and he will be an excellent, calm, steady hand. I don't think anyone would mess with him either. If he gives an instruction, you do it. Of course, they're in fourth place. They were the winners of the TTT, the team time trial. Can they use their combined strength tonight, though, to bag the points? Let's see from the boys in pink and blue. Coalition Alpha, as I mentioned earlier, sitting in third, but of course very aware that their women's team is sitting on top of the women's standings. They will look to move up. What a wonderful opportunity for Reese Howell to get both teams up on top of the podium. They can do it, for sure. Um, next, eSports, powered by Ensure. They've been incredibly consistent throughout they are only 18 points behind Aber Synergy. Bear in mind, just one of those tops of Box Hill will give you 150 points. That shows how important the consistency is between all of these different sprints. However, the leading team tonight is the all-German Abus Synergy team. Uh, they're, of course, our leading team, having led since the points race way back in October as well. So they're very good at points races too. They've won both of the points races we've had so far in this year's Zwift Grand Prix. So this night really should suit them. Yes, right. Indeed, I there. think we are ready to join some live action, Matt, by the sound of it. Um, and we'll catch up with where they've been to because they must be getting very close to the top of Box Hill for the first of four times now. Indeed. Well, there we go. There, I think they just—they're just coming near the top. You, they're right near the top. Sixty that is. to go, and it's yes, it is. There we go. Right on. It's one of the Fudo Punchers who's got a six-second advantage. So it looks like the rider from Fudo Punches, unless he completely capitulates here, Jez is going to take the points over the top. So they have rattled through the opening ten k's, and there is that finishing arch. Yes, that is amazing. We mentioned the Fudo Punchers were going to look for an opportunity to celebrate with their vat of wine this evening. And as you mentioned earlier, there he was in the lead. But here's the group closing in. How much has Yadane used in there? That looks like basically the vast majority of the main pack of 80 riders. Let me remind people again, across this whole, we'll call it 70k, 69.7k, um, you've got to hang in there and finish within five minutes of the winner, not the leading pack, but the actual winner, in order for your finishing points to score. And if the 80th person does finish, and that might not happen, but let's see, if the 80th person does finish, they will score five points. Now, bear in mind that some of the teams down at the bottom only have single figures of points anyway, Primor and D-Pack. So a real opportunity today for these points to be packed out today. I've just noticed, Matt, by the way, I'm sure you'll have seen this, the world champion making his way up to the front as well the world champions jersey on display of course in there and uh, that is a 
now reforming big pack as they go over the top. It's that second little kick after uh, the top of Box Hill. And Bjorn Andreasen, I thought so. Andreasen was it's moving through the pack and he's chosen to go clear by himself, the world champion. Yep. Yeah, he's got a two and a half second lead. Just look at that. It's lovely to see, isn't it? On the roads of Surrey, the Surrey Hills, um, our eSports world champion resplendent in those uh, digital rainbow bands. Such a strong rider. Won that uh, title back in Glasgow, of course, last year. Uh, but an interesting little move over the top. Uh, just off the back of what you're saying, just a little bit of housekeeping, Jez, as well. Just to yep. reiterate the power up today in terms of the draft power up. Yeah. You only get the draft power up. I was wrong. It's not about CDA at all. CDA changes when you use the aero power up. It just improves your drafting. But you have to be on the wheel of another rider. So you don't want to use it out on your own. You want to use it when you're in the pack, just to clarify that right. so there wasn't anything ambiguous yeah. there. Yeah. And as we saw, just I... coming over the, <laughs> the top of the climb, loads of riders using that on the flatter section there. It's best to use it yeah. on the flat or on a slightly downhill rather than on the climb. You get far more benefit when the speeds are higher. That makes sense. So... So you get a greater draft from the rider in front when you're in the pack. It's improved. You get yeah. more draft <clears throat> from them. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm Indeed. just being clear about it because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, as you know, I'm a kind of technical and, and uh, mathematical numpty, so I have to get my head around these things. Right, we're getting some lovely shots yeah. here. You can see Bjorn Andreasen just coasting there as well. He's tucked down in a what looks like a well a semi-legal UCI position. It's certainly a comfortable one in, on his on his Zwift bike. He is cruising. You can tuck. see him in the World Champions jersey IRL as well. He is in the Super Tuck, isn't he? Yeah, he's in the... We don't see the, that I, I, IRL well. anymore, do we? You, you don't. Not in that particular position. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, we've got different rules. It's, uh, it's rather yeah. than WADA and yeah. the UCI rules, it's Zada here. So, no, you can actually, once you get uh, above <laughs> a certain speed, I think it's 50, 55k an hour, 54k an hour, maybe 56k an hour, yep. you actually adopt the Super Tuck and um, you just keep on going. So, it's a really good... Um, opportunity to take a micro rest and he's still just off the front he's going to be caught I think as we go in through to the tunnels but a lot of riders still in this pack yeah but I do think Jez you're talking about the riders who get detached if they start if they really do climb Box Hill quickly uh, and riders get dropped it's going to be very hard I do think we might see yeah. 15 or 20 riders possibly not scoring today because we are really mm. in uncharted territory and I think Jez yeah. if it's cool let's bring in let's bring in Nathan because Nathan, the you know far more experienced at racing on Swift than us, knows this game like the back of his hand. But what I want to ask him is how how the team's going to approach a, a race that's so so different than anything we've seen before. We've seen the types of racing mixed up in Swift Grand Prix, points races, scratch races, team time trials, Nathan. But how a team's going to approach this? Seventy Ks on Swift is, some, is something we've never really seen before. It's not very usual at all, mate, is it? Yeah, it is a lot different when it comes to the only time you really see this is kind of KISS 100, the 100 kilometers every Sunday. So a lot of these racers actually show up to that race to get a little bit of endurance and a punch over around a two hour to three hour total. And so it's a really long standing race. So that's the one place that we see this a lot of times for these top end athletes. It's almost like the who's who weekly showdown. So um, but I think as far as tactically goes, because there are points up and at the top of Box Hill, you'll see again and again what we just saw essentially a, a, a you know somewhere between 9 to 13 watt per kilogram kick at the end of about a five minute vo2 effort for each and every time but you're going to get these little testers to see if we can throw riders off the front and how lax the pack gets some of those though i think are also going to be uh ways to tempt the pack to tempt other teams to get satisfied with the makeup of a breakaway and say, okay, well, we've got somebody who's up there who can challenge that 150 points, send them up the road. We're going to trust that and we'll mop up the rest. And I think because of that mop up the rest, at that point, if that happens, things will really calm down in the pack and there'll be a couple of eh, just kind of angry bees that wanted to be involved in a break trying to get back across. So I think that's kind of how things are going to play out for most of the day. We're seeing, guys, a fascinating sort of tickling of the front end here. Bjorn Andreessen seems determined to get a little breakaway going from that big group as well. He's got one of the Swedish Swifters with there. They've got two riders there. No, they haven't. So they've got one up there. So individual teams putting one or two in there. Quite a lot of riders using the transition onto the bridge, Southwark Bridge, going across the River Thames to come back towards the finish again to use their uh, power up. Correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, if you haven't used your power up by now, when you get the next one, you don't then have two power ups, do you? You don't have two. You, you basically lose the first one, you pick up the next one, don't you? I'm yeah, just... it's if you 
if you, don't, if you don't use it, yeah, if you don't use it, you lose it, basically. You can only ever have yep. one power up yep. onto it. But on this on this particular round, it's just the same one anyway. But, you know, when you look at how how long this how long they're going to be spending you might as well use them you know if you even if you yep. just if you use each and every power up at the right time for to optimize it that's a fair bit of energy saved so mm. yeah uh, use it when you can and it's best to use the faster the pack is moving the more beneficial you the more benefit you're going to get uh, out of that 40 seconds so it's a really nice opportunity just to take the pressure off the pedals as we see a rick Ottima. this guy's won some big races over the years on the zwift a big powerhouse he's just led through but uh it looks as if the peloton here are not letting a rider of this class go. But I think that was, as you said before, more of a tickling, just a kind of little bit of a precursor, just to see what this is like. As we know, in the Zwift Grand Prix, we although we've got these, these longer races on KISS, I'm still intrigued at how these big elite teams actually play this one. And I think to a degree, it's going to be a little bit of a suck it and see voyage of discovery. Um, so I'm intrigued to see... I'd love to be a fly on the wall in some of the DSs who are on Discord talking to their riders. Um, mm -hmm. Some riders in the team are going to be aggressive. Others are going to be a bit more cautious, saving themselves to the end, as we see Dawson now taking a punt off the front. Yeah, the Irishman for Wahoo Lacole. He sort of waited until we saw that last little uh, little move by Ottomar come back in and sort of bridged across to Ottomar and then went again himself. Getting lots of uh, ride-ons, which is nice to see. Thank you to everyone out there that's supporting us, watching us, particularly if you've been with us all the way through the Zwift Grand Prix. Um, the next two weeks is when we see it all decided. Chris Dawson in the baggy hat, looking good under the bridge as well. They're riding uh, IRL on our map, effectively. They're riding westward back towards Buckingham Palace on the north of the river. We're seeing Chris Dawson in his pain cave there, working hard. Uh, riding westward and it won't be too long before they're right up against the Thames again and then ready to cross back over the bridge. As always with Zwift, we've used the artistic license to kind of change some of the bridges around. The bridge they just rode across would have been Southwark Bridge, but it appears to be a version of London Bridge, which I absolutely love because you're kind of bringing together all the best parts of London. As we always do, we saw the same thing in Glasgow and bring together all the best parts of the city in the Zwift setting, in the Zwift world in particular. Right, two of the Coalition Alpha riders, Voyasan and Jacobs, trying to muster things up at the front end, but it's still sticking together though, Matt, isn't it? Yeah, it's still pretty sticky here. There's a few riders, as you say, um, he's got six seconds now, has the Irishman. Not the most aerodynamic piece of headwear that he could have opted <laughs> for, perhaps, but it's certainly a nice talking point for us. But I tell you what, the, the sort of numbers that he's having to put out to stay off the front at the moment, um, even in these early stages. Um, but again, it's, it's worth a go, isn't it? If you can build out a lead of maybe 10 or 15 seconds and you can sustain it, um, that might be your goal for the race. And I'm sure there's some teams, like we see with the Fudo Punchers earlier on, Clearly, one of their riders uh, has been tasked with the effort of just, OK, your finish line is first time up at Box Hill. You've scored as 150 points. That's a massive amount of points, yeah. 75 points per second. So I think it's worth taking a risk and saving other riders to mop up a little bit later on um, on going the offensive. So I think I don't necessarily think that Dawson has gone away on feel, on instinct. I think this might have been a preconceived plan to wait for that little bit of a lull just re-entering London again and going because he's now he's got double digits now 11.2 seconds this is looking good but he's having to to, to rate, maintain this sort of speed he's having to ride at between five, uh, four and a half and 5.5 watts a kilo he won't be able to do that all day but what he might be able to do is do that is for the next six or seven k's taking him to the top of Box Hill Matt, I just want to bring Nathan in here. Nathan, can I ask you a question from a team manager's perspective? Um, we're into the last two rounds of this, right? So the leading teams, the likes of Wahoo, Lacole, Coalition Alpha, Next, uh, Esports and Abus Synergy, they're kind of, I suspect, at some point watching each other. Is there an opportunity? We saw, um, who did we see earlier? Uh, Jadonet from Foudre Poncheurs. Is there an opportunity for an individual rider from one of the lesser ranked teams to hang out there? And are, do you think the big teams are going to be going, no, actually, just let him hang. We've got to watch. At what point do they start watching their big rivals? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. At this point, you're only going to be, it's kind of like a GC contention when it comes to time, just based on points, right? Like, who's up the road? Is it someone that we need to be worried about? No, it's not. They're not even close to us in points. We only need to be worried about beating these individuals. I think uh, there's also, you know, Wahoo Lacole, though, are on that list, you know, being close to the top. So I think with Wahoo Lacole, what's happening here is a little bit different than that. 
uh, where we're so early in the race and knowing that Dawson, if you take a look at his watts per kilogram versus what his raw watts are, this guy is a monster when it comes to just producing raw watts and speed. So they're sending him on the flatter sections of course to hope that he can fade climb and grab some points up at the top. The other teams are thinking that Dawson's not going to stay away the entire time and maybe think they're going to be able to climb uh, a lot faster than he can and catch him and uh, not be quite as worried about the you know initial effects of this where they're going to mop up more points later on i think they are keeping them on a leash though to not let it get too out of control because i think some of these teams are still going to want that 150 over the top but wlc if i got in their head and was thinking they're thinking dawson bigger rider big watts flatter sections that's where you send them Nathan, if you were racing tonight, what would your DS Alessio be be saying in your ear? Is it is it? And what do you prefer? Is it a calming, don't panic, everyone stay together, or, or do you want to be riled and <laughs> shouted at? You need to get on with it. What's well, the best for you? I don't, know I don't think you have a choice with Team Italy. With the Italians, <laughs> you don't have a choice. <laughs> yeah. Die, die, yeah. die! It's just like, I mean, it's nonstop. It's uh, just it's just a lot. It's a, it's a lot of fun. It's like being in a uh, a cycling. Uh, rave party and hanging out with Team Italy, which I really enjoy it actually. The energy is infectious with them, and so whether or not awesome. I would have thought I'd like it getting into the middle of it, I enjoyed it once I was in the middle of it all. Thank, thank you, Nathan. Hey, Tom Berry's got a very good fan. Look at that fan, Matt. He's about to take off, Tom Berry, riding for BL13. Yeah, that, now, that's the, that's the fan that, you need, isn't it? It certainly is, especially given the amount of time they're going to be on the bike here. We estimate yeah. that they're probably going to be riding today, or the winners anyway, between, we, maybe an hour and 25 minutes, something like that. Uh, and that's going to be still pretty quick. So I reckon between an hour and 25, an hour and a half. And that's a long time on Swift. We always yeah. talk about the importance of making sure you keep your core body temperature down and your fluids up. Well, more, even more important when you're on the bike for like over 45 minutes, 50 minutes in over an hour, it's massively important because it can have enormously yep. detrimental effects. So the way that these riders feed, uh, hydrate and keep cool, massively important. So he's got, yeah, an extra, almost like an industrial sized uh, fan there. And uh, as you said, I think he might have had to be tethered down with bungee straps. Otherwise, he might actually <laughs> take off uh, wherever he is. But he's certainly keeping cool. Yeah, totally. Well, Chris Dawson is looking cool, despite the fact that he's knocking out con consistently really in excess of five watts per kilo, seven watts per kilo now. As Nathan mentioned, he's a powerful rider and he is trying to stay clear before they enter back into the Surrey Hills, just south of the, the River Thames and ready to get towards Box Hill itself. Don't forget, folks at home, 17 kilometers per lap this one. Let's have a look at Coalition Alpha. Nearly all of them, they were all in team kit until we saw uh, Han Yun Zhang taking off his jersey. Um, nice to have everyone in picture there as well. Third overall at the moment. And according to this, so they've got 90 race points. They packed it in well that first time up there. Haven't we? we haven't looked at too much about how the points were scored, but they must have had a lot of their riders right up at the front of that, Matt. Bearing in mind, 75 points for second, 50 points for third. Um, let's a little look back and see who it was that was their best point scorer, actually. You're good with these stats, Matt. You might be able to do that for me, maybe, but uh, certainly packing well. And no, they certainly they have are. Zangers. If, if, you could score, I mean, if you could score points early on and you sacrifice ride, riders, it, it, and what it does as well, it's like in anything, it, 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 it motivates. It, not that the, any of these runs will need motivating. They're all geared up for this. They, they, know what, they know what they need to do. But for the morale and for the spirit of the team to get up the road early and have essentially a win within a win is massively important. And the team can kind of feed off that. Um, so, yeah, the Fudra Punchers uh, have a great start today. Four more or four more opportunities or three more opportunities, should I say, to take points at the top. But look at this lead. It's not very often in Zwift racing at all that you see a solo rider with a lead of around 30 seconds. This is impressive. Um, and it this is. rider, you know, can um, look at the kind of power he's having to put out here. And that power is easier to put out once you start to hit the slopes. Um, it's just a matter of can he maintain it? He can almost afford to lose 15 or 20 seconds towards the top and back off. But a half a minute lead uh, at the mm. bottom of Box Hill, that's massively impressive from the man from Wahoo Lacole. Particularly when you consider the <clears throat> the level of the riders we saw trying to do that before him. We saw Bjarne Andersen have a go. Yeah. It didn't work. Uh, but 
I'm surprised, Matt. I mean, Wahoo Lakola are in fourth place. They're only, um, oh, how many points down are they on, on the top three? They're only two points off Coalition Alpha anyway. I don't understand. I mean, we did see Coalition Alpha mustering, but I'm surprised they weren't on this straight away. It's not like it's one of our lower ranked teams who's got a rider up there. This is a, a you know, very close to the podium. And one rider, as you say, is over 30 seconds now, 33 seconds. Yeah, it was a very, very good move indeed. And just going back to and the Wahoo Lakola, already they were fourth in, in the team points. So Fudra Ponches, courtesy of that win, of course, um, are leading the team points at the moment with 150. Coalition Alpha second, Exagon, and then Wahoo Lakola. Another illustration of how well Exagon have gone this year. They've been so, so consistent from the very off. Uh, as we look at the peloton, we're looking mm. at the uh, the Movistar team here. Kershaw, Vell, Lednes, Power, and Miguel Angel Andres. But there's a few riders already starting to yep. struggle. You can see the, the shape of the peloton there, some gaps going. And I tell you what, that isn't the full field there already. No, um, it's still no. pretty early in this race. A few riders um, struggling to hold the pace on the lower slopes of Box Hill. Well, they are on the lower hope slopes of Vox Hill. You can see it ramping, and our leader, Dawson, is already into the first of the switchbacks as well. So familiar to anyone who's ridden up there in real life. But it is a if you've only ever ridden up it in in Zwift, if you haven't already, then go and ride it. But it's um, you can really get a real sense for it. It's incredibly realistic, actually, Matt, isn't it? Oh, it's it's the the gradient is basically meter for meter um it really is and, and i've ridden and i've no doubt you have jez on multiple occasions yeah. in real life up it and it's it's uncanny it, it really is it really is uncanny and box hill although it's an iconic climb let's be honest it's not an out to zwift it's it's not a particularly steep mm. climb but it's a climb that you can really get into rhythm uh, the gradient doesn't really vary that much and and the nearer they get to the top it actually flattens so run one of the steeper parts is six percent seven percent maximum on of this one but it's a climb it's a fast climb and you can actually benefit from sitting in the wheel because they'll be moving up this climb pretty quickly um but yeah it's a, it's remarkably realistic it really is um and quite nostalgic as well because i've been riding up this climb for uh, quite a few years but to see it rendered almost perfectly in zwift is pretty special oh yeah it was of course the the run-in uh for the olympic road race I think the time trial went up it as well in 2012. Is that right, man? I know the Olympic road race finished back up in front of massive crowds in London 2012. The time trial didn't. No, the time trial was more out near uh, East Molesey, that sort of neck of the woods. No. But the, all the road right. races went up it multiple times, yeah. Well, this guy is riding his own time trial. 384 watts currently. That's 5.1 watts per kilo kilogram right now and necking up above 6 watts per kilogram. But it is snaking a little bit of... Uh, a fight back here as well, by the looks of it. And this is Turek as well, riding for um, Next Esports. I do apologise. Yeah, Daniel Turek, yes. a great rider, the Czech rider. It's a classy rider on the road as well. So when you look at the, the riders, we've got the Swift specialist, the Esports specialist. Of course, all these riders will ride out on the road as well. But Turek as well is a rider that's performed exceptionally well internationally out on the road, but has really mm. you know, taken to, to Swift racing for the last few years like a duck to water. So classy, classy rider. And let's be honest, some of the road riders will really like their chance in this one because of the added yep. angle of endurance. And uh, Turek... Uh, is about to be joined by Kaminsky here. But still, look at the lead. A minute ago, it was 32 seconds for Dawson. But that real injection of pace by Turek has slashed in very short order, 10 seconds off the lead yep. of the Irishman. And it's interesting because these are the teams in second and third who are now on the attack as well. They're chasing down Wahula Cole rider, uh, Chris Dawson, who there his team is in fourth. These two teams who are on the attack now are third and second. Big question, Matt. What are Abus Synergy thinking, our leading team? We haven't really seen much yet of the blue top boys in the the uh, the blue, black and red. Where are they? Well, they're currently fourth and fifth, so they're lurking. Paradigms is there as mm. well, and it's an all-Belgian team. Here we go. Van Elst Here is we also go. there, so they are starting to muster, yeah. actually. But they've been keeping their powder dry. I know it's a, it's a kilometer's cliche, but they certainly have. But all the big hitters, as we head towards the top of the climb, this is where it flattens out, and this is where, if you deploy your draft um, power-up just at the right time, you're going to get the most benefit just as we go towards the top, and then you can really hey, no. pick up the pace and try and accelerate <laughs> out through the arch. No coaching, Matthew Stevens. Just as you say it, they all do it as well. Look at that, right on time as well. Here we go. It does look like Dawson's going to hang on, but boy, is it going to be close come the top. It's probably only about 10 seconds by the time he goes through. So he has made it count. The Irishman Chris Dawson takes the maximum 
150. Don't forget, there's only points for the top five. One of this lot's going to miss out. It looks to me like those four have all scored points. Bjorn Andreasen might have just taken second, and they're going to catch Dawson just over the top. I wonder, Matt, we haven't seen... Let's look at the gaps behind them, because they're growing seven, eight, nine seconds going back behind this lot. I wonder whether we might see a formation of a leading group here or whether it will come back together. Boy, did he Possibly. leave it close, though. He could have got caught there, couldn't he, and not scored any points at all. Yeah, maybe you just wanted, just wanted to make sure you never know because the speed that the group comes up behind, especially when all the, you've got these draft power-ups been used, is pretty quick. So he clearly wanted to make sure Belt and Braces had got it. Dawson took the points, but you're quite, quite right. There is a little bit of a split here. But um, Vuyasan was up there. Andreasen actually didn't get second. He was actually fourth place. Uh, Martin scored as well. But I think, again, we saw five different teams scoring points. So the points relatively well distributed. As you can see, there is the latest point score uh, on the left-hand side with Wahoo now moving into first place with 225 points. Fudre Puncher mm. didn't score on that second round. They're with 150. Coalition Alpha with 125. Exagon with 75, tied with Abus Synergy. So to answer your question, Abus Synergy now moving up and have got on at the point score. And Toyota Elite E-Cycling in sixth currently with 50. And, but this little yep. league group does look like a pretty handy one. Yeah, Kaminsky just joining the back of it there. I'm just, uh, we're looking at the current positions of Abus Synergy. So they have got everyone in that leading group, crucially, as we look down to Dukaku, who's the fifth of their five riders. They're all in there in that main group as well. So that's good for them. Um, Nathan Guerra, I just wonder if I could bring you back in. I've got a tactical question for you, Nathan. Um, I'm just thinking, we've just seen Chris Dawson make a massive effort. Now, it might be that he's in such good form tonight that uh, Hal Davies is going to say to him, just keep going, mate, we're going to go again this time round. Try and get clear, try and get some more points. But when you've got five riders, particularly as with the strength in depth, we've just noticed that Abus Synergy have got everyone in this leading group anyway. Is there any merit to, to basically saying, like, Dawson, you're our man for the first time up it. I mean, there's four ascents, right? So you can split the team quite evenly. And then do you say, right, next time up it, uh, Ben Mir, the American riding for Wahoo Lakota, it's going to be his chance to try and get clear. I know it's not that simple, but it just seems mathematically so neat. We've got four ascents and five riders. <laughs> Is there anything in that? Yeah, that's a... Uh, th yeah, I think there's probably something to that if they do have breakaway... Uh, specialist somebody who wants to try and get away and not just challenge the climb I, I really do think when it comes to Dawson uh, challenging at the end of a climb like that that requires around six watts per kilogram in order to hang on with a punch at the end um, that uh, it would be really difficult for him to challenge with a 12 watt per kilogram sprint like we saw from Pedardines and the rest there and so I have a feeling for him specifically that was really tailored to his rider type uh, that attack get his distance get his time get the advantage where he is the strongest compared to everyone else and when the pack honestly just doesn't have a whole lot of interest at that moment to chase down and where they're going to be infighting a little bit more about who's doing the work i'm not chasing that year i'm not chasing that they're all looking at each other going we're not doing anything until you're not getting any advantage on us. We'll do it once we actually hit the climb, which is which is what we saw. Now, when it comes to a rider like Ben Mir, very different situation. He doesn't really have a sprint. Uh, the guy is just a motor uh, when it comes to uh, hitting any kind of extended VO2 or threshold. But on a flat situation like that, he wouldn't be gaining uh, nearly as much uh, speed as we saw from Dawson. So I think for Mir, they're going to be looking more toward the end of the race when it comes to Ben Mir and some of the other uh, higher profile riders when it comes to pure climbing uh, prowess and also later on in races. Interesting. Now we've seen a bit of a regrouping here as well by the looks of it. And one rider trying to go clear as we go up the escalator, which I absolutely love. There's, there's an iconic... Uh, London imagery for you, but coming back in together, Movi Star. We've just been looking at their team actually. It's Vida Mail who had a little go off the front there, back in that leading group. Um, it's worth me pointing out, by the way, particularly if you're joining us at the beginning of this year, they're getting close to going back across the start line again, where they'll pick up their draft power ups, which is why you're seeing quite a lot of the riders using them now anyway, just to save a little bit of energy. It's worth me pointing out, and I didn't do it at the beginning, that uh, all. Um, 
Drafting is enabled in here, obviously, as I said, but also bike and wheel performance is neutralized. So despite the fact that you can see the riders in different bikes, we also talked about equipment and helmets and things being more or less aero. All of that is neutralized for the Zwift Grand Prix. So it's a very even level playing field. And I'm pleased to say as well, um, the adjudicators within the Zwift Grand Prix team are incredibly hot on the equipment setup and calibration, all that kind of thing as well. So you can be certain what you're watching is a very pure race too. I should have mentioned that at the beginning because I'm conscious that some people will be joining us for the Zwift Grand Prix for the first time. While I mentioned joining us for the first time, by the way, it's worth me pointing out, and uh, Nathan, you'll know all about this. Matt, we were chatting about it just before we came on air. This is the year where we launched the biggest ever Zwift again event, the Zwift Games, all the way through March this spring. It's the biggest Zwift event ever. It's not just for the pros either. It's for all you Zwifters at home who are watching. It is spread across three different championship races, the Sprint Championships, the Epic Championships, and the Climb Championships, which bring it all to its conclusion on the Alpe de Zwift every single week for the first three weeks in March. Check it all out at Zwift.com. Go and read up about it all as well. The Zwift games are coming and you'll see an awful lot of these pros who are racing in the Zwift Grand Prix switching straight to that in March. It's a wonderful, this has been a wonderful stepping stone towards the Zwift games, the biggest ever esports cycling event in history. It's going to be just a bit good. I'm excited about it, guys. I'm sure you are too. Yeah, and I think as well, given that it's only... It's not that far away. There'll be a lot of riders who will be using the Zwift, Zwift Grand Prix as important preparation. There's plenty of races in between then, of course. We've, we've got the, the Tour de Zwift going a while, a bit of a nudge the other day on the Tour de Zwift. So lots of opportunities to keep the condition. But as you say, the thing I like particularly about the concept of the first ever Zwift Games is the fact that anybody can can uh, can start off and enter it it's probably one of the most inclusive events uh, well the whole of the, the whole of the Zwift community is massively inclusive but this is uh, there's something for everybody in this one I cannot uh, wait to see uh, what happens and how that unfolds but uh, in the meantime we've got some mm. big hitters Rick Ottema and Lionel Villasan who have cleared off the front they've only got about a second and a half but I tell you what the duo of Ottema and Villasan relaying as um as well, they've just been caught. They're not two riders that you want to uh, to let to give too much rope. Bida Mel, Zach Nier, also there as well from the United States of America. But but Mel, it's the second time he's been on the offensive. That little escalator that you're talking about earlier on, Jez, um, it's only it must be just 20, 25 metres long, if that, but it's horrible. If you hit it and you're not in, given the right cadence, don't select the right gear, you can almost stop. And it's, uh, it looked like he tried to sort of give it a little bit of a nudge there and open up a bit of a gap, but he's clearly feeling good because he's gone straight over the top again and is currently just moving under the underpass. And it's Kaminski of Poland who has managed to punt across, but they've still got, they've got a couple of seconds lead. But this is quite active, a little bit more active mm. than I thought it might be. I wonder if it'd be quite neutral, but I think given, given the distance, given the fact there's nothing really to reflect on, I think the teams have seized the opportunity to try and race a little bit disruptively. And I just want to bring in Nathan here, Nathan. Do you think this sort of race, the distance here, because it's relatively unknown, not unheard of, as you alluded to before and talked about and detailed, but do you think this sort of race, given the profile, you can afford to take a few risks and just see what happens? Yeah, I completely agree with that. I actually think that in the back end of the race, we're going to see a lot more of this. I think there's, you're going to hit a comfort point within this pack when the big names start going now is when i'm okay with taking risks because behind there's not a, the only firepower behind now at this point is those who can match me and i expect to be racing so they're going to start thinking well now is when we can burn matches because anybody that i'm going to race is going to have to burn some matches too to come along with me uh, a lot of the pack is going to start whittling down. Maybe not quite as much at this halfway-ish point, but after this next climb, I think it's going to be a little bit more no holds barred getting some uh, creativity out on course to see what is actually going to sink, specifically because of the level of comfort the riders will have with not being worked against by an entire team, but just those they really are going to be racing in the end. Yep. That's a really interesting point. It's pretty exciting. And as you say, and there will be some riders as well um, I think it's worth to say, Jez, as well, that because of the distance we've got here, some riders 
might have just struggled earlier on and then some riders after 45 minutes come into their own as well uh, given given this is a long race there's a there's far more phases with it which a rider can pass through it actually start to feel good near the end so i'm waiting to see um if that unfolds but yeah lots of attacking on this little flat section running yeah. parallel with the river thames just over to the left is the london eye somewhere but yeah it's a, it takes me back it's almost like we're there isn't it Oh, it's wonderful. This is the embankment, isn't it? The, the embankment. Yeah. This this road itself has been used for so many things. Stages of the Tour of Britain. Um, what else have we seen around here? Pro crits and things Ride. going way back over the Ride years. London. Ride London, Ride of London. course. Ride. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, the embankment is such a, a famous London racing road in a way. Um, Bjorn Andreessen just away, the world champion for a short while there and back in the fold. I think this time, this might be now matt the little 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 pause in things if we look at the watts per kilo it's still pretty high isn't it it's still cranking on but it might be the slight pause before the next uh, the next ascent we're basically halfway through the race now we've got two more ascents of box hill and then the uh, the run in we, the, we i should point out by the way the final time they actually get to the base of box hill turn around the little roundabout at the bottom which is down by the motorcyclist cafe down there in real life those of you who know box hill and surrey they turn around that roundabout and go back on themselves so then go back across the river and finish right in front of buckingham palace on the mall or the mall whichever you might call it we're a bit split on that one um, I'm finding myself, Matt, starting to look down. Every time we bring up the likes of a Deepak Elite, I'm just looking down to see if anyone's close, dare I say it, to the five-minute mark, which is the cutoff for scoring points today. Uh, Mackie there, the British rider for Deepak Elite, he is three minutes 13. So as you say, really the pressure is on everyone. Even if you know you're off the back, if you're in a small group or you're by yourself, you are in a full-on time trial to stay within the five minutes buffer of that leader. Yeah, it's going to be hard. I think not if you've easy. lost three minutes now, it's not and not taking anything away from the riders that have already been no. detached because you know the, the, the standard of of, of esports now, the standard of racing on Zwift uh, is so so high. You have to be. These are elite elite athletes at the front here, yeah. world champions, riders who ride internationally on the road as pros as well. Um, there's some good riders here. Riders have been finalists in the Zwift Academy, for example. So it's it's a classy field, but and, and the speed they're moving at, given how aggressive it's been, given the willingness of multiple multiple class rides to go off the front. The peloton, if they want to bring the back, have to ride at the same speed. And if you've already been dropped and you're suffering, you're going to be losing three, four, five, even more, six, eight seconds per kilometre. Uh, so I think it's mm. going to be hard. But these rides will not give up, that is for sure. But it's going to be a lonely ride through London and the Surrey Hills if you're off the back at the moment. Has to be said, Matt, Rick Ottomer, I think, has been the most active rider. I'd give him the most aggressive rider so far in this one. He's been constantly sneaking on and off the front all the time. The hexagon, or sorry, you used the French pronunciation. You're absolutely right. Hexagon earlier, and he was off the front there, back in the fold now. Trying to work out, you're, you're slightly better at these things than me, looking down the numbers, just how big this leading group is now. It, it looks about half the field, maybe 35 riders, something like that. Yeah, 30, um, 40 riders there. I think uh, yeah. we've, we've, we've got as they, as a great shot as they uh, round the corner and head back in a southerly direction. Uh, actually heading towards Waterloo at the moment. Um, but no, there's uh, Andreas. And yeah, I think we've got about 40 riders in that front group. So a lot of riders out mm. the back. But, but the thing is, if you are out the back, as we see, let's say there's 40, 45 riders here, still a lot of points on the road. So the yeah. key is to yeah. get into a group and get into a rhythm with a group and ride together. Uh, try and keep numbers together over the top of the climb. The last thing you want to do is try and do a hero ride and ride on your own. So if you are in a group, um, especially if you've got a teammate with you, it's sticking together now, not losing too much time. But as I say, it's a long, long day in the virtual yeah. saddle today. Um, as things settle down just a little bit mm. uh, for a moment, this is what I think um, definitely Nathan was talking about. Um, in a race this long, even in a shorter race, there are moments where it settles for a minute. And this can do two things. It can provide a false sense of security because riders will go straight over the top. Or it offers a real opportunity to recalibrate, c communicate, recover before you go again. And I think that's what we're seeing briefly here because we're going to be approaching Box Hill for the third time very shortly. Yeah, this is the third lap. Uh, they've just gone south of the river, as Matt mentioned, going over the River Thames. They headed towards what would be the National Theatre. 
and uh, well, what would be eventually Elephant and Castle, the likes of those places in South London. I was born in North London, Matt, and there's always this big rivalry between the North and the South. So I'm always delighted to see on Zwift that we've basically done away with South London altogether. We've grabbed Surrey, dragged it up to cover South London completely. <laughs> <laughs> it's all gone. No, listen, I, lo- I lived in South London for a while. I lived in, uh, in Greenwich in Charlton, and I, and I got to know Hearn Hill and all those wonderful South London cycling locations. It's a great place to be a cyclist. But, but Surrey was considered great. And so it was pulled as a carpet all the way over the edge of South London <laughs> to bring Box Hill up. Uh, and Rick Ottimer fancies getting to Box Hill before the others, by the looks of it. He is on a charge tonight, isn't he, the Dutchman? Yeah, he certainly is. Off he goes. It's a real, uh, a real solid, shrewd, important recruitment for the Exagon team. He's now opened up a five-second lead. Probably looked at what Dawson did last time through. Well, Dawson went... At about the same time, actually. Well, no, a little. It's, Autumn has gone a little bit later, so he's had more time in the peloton to save himself. But he's really surging here, and is moving clear. He's opened up 6.7 seconds. He's riding 167 BPM. That's his higher heart rate. But ha- holding at the moment 6.1 watts a kilo, uh, just over, which equates, as you can see, to 500 watts. Eye-watering watts here. But uh, let's bring in Nathan again. A good move here by Ottima. Waited a little bit longer than Dawson, but this is a rider, Nathan, we've known very, very well. He's won some big events. He's got an engine, especially on a climb that's not super steep to get into a good tempo here. This is a really different situation, too, from what we've seen all of the other climbs. Ottima doing this at this point, I if, if they go bottom to top, you notice the other climbs, they didn't go bottom to top. They kind of all looked at each other a little bit, and they climbed at a steady, very high pace, and then it was a kick at the end. This instigation might end up making a breakaway pack or at least a much more whittled down pack up and over the top for the fight here. Now, if Ottima backs off and it all settles down, there's no counters we might end up grupo compacto again but uh you know this instigation definitely changes the nature of this specific climb this third time up and it it, it really makes it interesting to me as to whether or not we're going to end up with a very reduced field at the top of this sprint yeah it looks like it's about yeah, court yeah. now i think Ottima. so that uh, six or seven seconds at the bottom and as you said i think the class of Ottoman, the fact he didn't open up too much of a lead, and the fact that in game as well, you'll be able to see him in front. He's that little carrot, literally a carrot in the colours of Hexagon there, Jez, but he's about to be caught. Um, but the mm-hmm. shape of the bunch here changing. Duffy on the front, Zach Nair as well. It looks like um, the riders are from Next Esports just trying to make sure they're represented. Yep, this is Johan Noren as well, the Swedish rider just coming through as well into the big switch back. We're coming round to that steeper part of Box Hill, as Matt was mentioning. It ramps a little bit. Rocket, Rick, oh, Rocket Ottomer, I went to call him there. Maybe I'll call him that from now on. Just slotting himself back into that group as we go over the National Trust Box Hill icon on the road. And uh, Noren also now just being brought back into the fold. But that is, again, quite a reduced leading group with dripping riders off the back of that now all the time let's see how the swedish swifters are doing we've already got svensson who's a long way down so i'm not sure what's happened there uh they've got two leaders in two riders i should say noren and bjorkland in that leading group and i guess those next two are probably in the group behind things bunching up back there as well yeah but, definitely uh, these two i guess if these two can no they're not going to stay clear are they it's coming back in again so cautious what, matt yeah. It was just what Nathan was saying. We've we've seen the climb ridden each time up, which is fascinating in terms of the way we we didn't know what was going to happen in today's race because there's been no precedent before. The distance, the style of racing, but they're racing racing it differently again. Ottoma went, did it got caught, but I think we might see a little bit more of a selection. This has been raced far more aggressively and given the speed that they're moving at it's very difficult to break away again because of the gradient there's a real benefit of the sort of speed they're moving at now only on five percent they're still they're going to be riding at about 25 maybe even 30 k's an hour um the record in in real life on this climb equates to kind of 20 21 miles an hour so although it's a hard (laughs) climb it's a fast climb it's a it's a fast one as mel now tries again we're coming to the top here You've got about a kilometre or so before we get to the top. And remember, the worst of the climb is now over. This is where it gets fast. 
Seven watts per kilo for the Norwegian Vidal Mel. We've seen him attack at least two or three times already in this race. And this is big watts being thrown down. But once again, it's Bjorn Andreasen. Look at that. Over eight watts per kilo from the world champion. He's ridden across to him as well. Has he got the momentum to hang on to this as well? Let's look who's chasing behind. He's, they're both in excess of two seconds ahead. Uh, but we can see power-ups being used here as well, just to get a bit of extra draft. Perrin using that one brilliantly, Matt, by the looks of it, to just get up behind them, get in the draft, and then press on past them. Still exactly. so close, it's though. Yeah, it's still very close. It's still a fair way to go. We've got another couple of corners. Um, in fact, you can't actually see the finish. All these rods will know it really well, but you can't see the finish until about 50 metres to go. But the road veers off to the right in a minute, continues to climb, but only lightly. But Perrin about to be caught again by Andreasen, who's found something pretty special. No real surprise. You have to be a pretty special rider to wear those bands. That is for sure. But this effort by Perrin at the front has really started to string things out. But remember... In about five or six seconds, maybe a little bit more, we're going to see a lot of uh, power-ups deployed. And there they come. It's yeah. a 40-second long power-up. Vital they time it right. We're coming through to the finish again at the oh. top here now. Tom Perrin's so close to hanging on, but he's been overlapped by one of his own teammates as well. That's Duffy by the looks of it. Brian Duffy, so an opportunity here for next eSports to score some big points. If Perrin can hang on, this could be a brilliant run. I know Perrin's slipping back as well, but it does look like Duffy. No, he's not. Our leaders, Ava Synergy, are going to take it by the looks of it. Van Elst, I think, just coming through on the line there by the looks of it, Matt. They are playing this. I just wonder if they are playing it absolutely brilliantly, our leading team, Ava Synergy. They're not getting involved in all the attacking. They're just there when it needs to be done. They're just smart. They've just ridden so smart. I mean, it was Van Elst ahead of Brian Duffy, then Kaminsky, then the world champion, Andreasen, who's just rolling through there. A split has occurred, and Martin Martins also in the mix there for uh, Toyota. But uh, it's still Wahoo Lacole that lead off the back of the points. They've got 265 now, Jez. Aber Synergy with 225. Coalition Alpha 175. Fudra with that early scoring 150. Then Toyota, Exagon, and Next Esports. So close at the top mm. between Abus and Wahoo. But Wahoo at the moment have a 40 point lead. And there's one more opportunity, one more ascent of Box Hill to come. Wow, so our leading team getting maximum points there as well. But as Matt has said, it is Wahoo Lacole, the team who went into this evening's racing in fourth place, who started this year in fourth place with two rounds ago. Wahoo Lacole, who are leading. Don't forget, I should point out, although they're sitting on 265 points, it doesn't mean those exact points are added. We give uh, 35 points to the winning team on the night, which goes to the team overall as well. But Wahoo Lacole looking really good. There is just now one more ascent of box hill where the first five riders across it will score and then let me remind you they complete one more complete lap almost get to box hill turn around and head for the finish line on the mall right in front of buckingham palace and there there are points for everyone but crucially matt that is going to be some sprint because there are 300 points for first place at that finish line it's going to be a biggie that yeah, it is. It's uh, it's a, yeah, a lot. 280, 260, as you said, all the way down to 80th. But I don't think 80 riders are going to score today. Not with this five-minute cutoff. There's definitely going to be quite a few riders that finish outside of that one. And I think we've got about 30 riders in this front group here. One or two riders making sure they get back in contact as we look at uh, a selection of riders here. Andreasen, Martin Martins, Kaminsky, Duffy, Van Elst. Some classy, classy bike yeah. riders indeed. But let's, let's bring Nathan back in to just see. Nathan, what did you reckon? We've seen the climb. As you, as you suggested, as you, as you said, we've seen Box Hill being climbed differently each time up. Based on what we've just seen, how do you think the last time up is going to go? Get out your crystal ball for us if you can. It's going to be interesting. You know, it, it really comes down to if they want to send attacks from from whether or not they send from the bottom to about that halfway point where it kind of snakes a little bit and before you hit those paintings across, you know, it gets into that 5 to 6% gradient where there's a good amount of drafting, the speeds are higher. If you've made it to that point, it's going to be really hard to separate things. 
if they attack from the get go, or at least up until that point, I could see things really separating. I do think we are going to see some riders try and make that kind of a move, especially those teams that have not been able to score with these high end sprints at the top. I think we're going to see a lot more attacks. Now, the other thing though is, if you notice, Autumn is off the back now. He <laughs> like you attack at the yeah. bottom. It's a big mm-hmm. risk. Neil Freyett's off the back now. Jay Bruin's off the back now. Christoph Thiem is off. And these are riders who were trying to get involved early on. It's big risk, big reward. And some of these riders not really getting the best out of it uh, if you do go early. So you better have some uh, pretty good engines and some confidence if you're not going to go with the pack. I do think that there are riders, though, that are standout riders. Lionel Viasen comes to mind. Uh, Thomas Perrin we saw on the move. Uh, you know, there's there's some big names in here that could go bottom to top, and we see we see what some of one of those riders go. Be on the watch out. We're gonna next thing you know, orange numbers gonna be going from the bottom all the way to the top of this thing. Yeah, definitely. That is interesting, yeah, Nathan. Just 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 let's rem- remind ourselves. So far, they've been sprinting for a maximum 150 points. Bearing in mind this is an endurance race, the longest race in Zwift Grand Prix history, to score 150 points at the finish, you'd only have to come 15th. So that finish is so important. I'm just looking down through this uh, of the the riders who are still in this leading group. There are, I think, three riders from Toyota Elite e-cycling. So Toyota have got some plenty of riders. Castelli have got, I think, three, maybe four even in that leading group as well. So there are some teams that have been just sort of hanging in there and waiting. I wonder whether we might look back on it, come the finish line and say, actually, there were some sitting and waiting who knew the bigger points were coming. It's a risk, though, isn't it? It certainly is, but if you can it's, bag, it's a big uh, risk. It's, it's, it, 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 again, and, and that's what it's this risk reward, isn't it? As as we've just seen, we saw one of the uh, the most preeminent riders in, in Zwift racing and esports, and uh, you know Rick Ottima, sacrifice himself to go for an effort, and now he's he's out the back, and he's not going to score big tonight. But at least he had a go. So there is a risk. A Gledner is now off the front for Movistar, a former teammate actually of Rick Ottima. They both rode with uh, Movistar a couple of years ago. Now on rival teams, of course. Uh, but a little group's just gone clear now. Um, on Bjorn Andreasen has yeah. just latched on to the back of a rider, that Penitza, just there, and Turek. So four riders going clear with a three-second lead. So the other teams now have got to be very, very wary of this one. And I would imagine they're going to shut this one pretty quickly because this is a dangerous move with some classy, classy riders there. It definitely is, Matt. And this is the point where we've seen other attacks going in the last three laps, and none of them have even looked like surviving. But there we go. I say it again, and it's being closed down again. The French rider, Milor, just closing it down as well. And power-ups, of course, as we've seen every lap so far, now being chucked out chucked out from the back pocket and used because we're back towards the finish line again. So you might as well use them here. And you can see the effect it's having as well of riders who are coming through too. So more or less all back together but what we're not seeing so much of is the riders who are dripping off the back of this leading group and as we mentioned already already the likes of rick ottima dripping off the back having been a big player in the race so far as well indeed it's a bl13 rider now uh harris uh, blt 13 pablo level velo uh, just been caught, uh, just as I got his name out, he's been caught by Vidar yeah. Mel. And, uh, Kaminsky goes straight over the top uh, as well. Kaminsky having a pretty active day for Coalition Alpha. The team, of course, across on the women's side of things who lead, but um, uh, they're third place here, 93 points on the overall. But this is a drastically reduced group. That, that last time up the climb, that the way it was ridden a little bit differently, they went pretty hard for the last kilometre has really made a pretty well, decent selection this a lot of the hitters you'd expect and maybe one or two surprises uh, in this group as Barry now moves clear yeah, well sorry well, Barry's just a little bit further back shall I say yeah this this you can see I think we're starting to see Matt here a little bit the fatigue creeping in as it would getting this deep into a 70 kilometer race not just a 70 kilometer race because of the distance but because of the accelerations that are being made constantly we keep talking about the watts per kilo if you're not a Zwift rider maybe if you're not a racing cyclist yourself and you're wondering kind of what that equates to um well, <laughs> anything, anything that gets you into the red is going to be a problem. And for some people, that might be three watts per kilo. But for these elite riders, once you certainly once you're knocking above five, I always think that when you see five on there, you know they're cranking on. 
when you get into six, seven, eight watts per kilo, you really know they're going for it. And they're the kind of efforts for most of these riders, once they're getting above six into the sevens and eights watts per kilo, you're not going to hold that for that long. I know that's a really unscientific explanation of it, but it's quite a nice way of reading into the numbers as you look down on them on the right hand side of the screen there, I guess. Indeed, no, it's, uh, it's Martins now who's moved clear. Uh, the man who won, is a, a such a versatile rider, came to the fore as a, a exceptionally gifted climber. I think he did, did win on Alpe de Zwift earlier this year, did the German Martins for the Toyota Elite Cycling. He's tried to go long. He's opened up a little bit of a gap. Brian Duffy Jr. of Next Esports trying to bring the gap back. But uh, but no, you, you're quite right. Um, that watch per kilo is uh, it's different for everybody. Um, but of course, the big, big numbers we saw some numbers earlier when riders are really accelerating. We're looking at between 10 and 13 watts a kilo. That's that's an unsustainable sprint, really. That's something that you can only do mm. for like between five and 15 seconds. But then six, five, six watts a kilo is what these riders can actually maintain for the best part of an hour, um, uh, depending, of course, uh, on your level of fitness. But uh, it's pretty worth bringing Nathan in, actually, to, to see how riders kind of measure their effort um, on a day like this. We've, we've seen some of the shorter, some, some of the swift races we've had this year, Nathan, you know, half an hour, lots of really high spikes, but how will riders tackle this one and how will they moderate the kind of efforts, especially how many times can a rider, you know, s sustain six watts a kilo? How, they, they might be able to do that for five minutes, but at what cost will that come to a rider in a race like this? Yeah, and here's the thing is a lot of riders who are big favorites so far as as far as like what we've seen from them in the Zwift Grand Prix, have you not noticed I mean Michael Plantero going head to head, you know, for the win a few weeks back, I haven't seen him on the front at all where other riders, you know, Next Esports and some of these others have been all in at the front of a lot of these sprints so far. And that tells me that there's a few uh, riders, as you were saying, measuring their efforts and waiting for the moments. Martin Martins, I think, was this the first time he scored this last time up under the top as well? And now later in the race, starting to get active for that Toyota team. Um, you know, as far as who's measured things the most, I don't have in front of me right this moment, you know, an average watch per kilogram. Maybe I need to go take a look at that if I can find it. But who's put out the least amount of power so far per their watch per kilogram versus what's going to happen in this last lap? I would not be surprised if there's a high ratio on that. That low watts per kilogram first half, the second half of the race, you're going to see all that energy absolutely explode. Watch out for plant throw. He's been so quiet. That is interesting, Nathan. So we're now we're now deep into that kind of fatigue resistance part of the race as well. What we haven't yet talked about is we talked a bit about cooling and the fans. But Nathan, can I just ask you one more question? It, it, it's um, I'm just thinking about fueling as well, because over this kind of distance, I'd, I'd suspect some of these riders would be necking a gel or two maybe in here. Or am I wrong? What do you reckon? Oh. 100%. You know, with the most recent, you know, in, in the years past, big changes in the sugar intakes, glycogen stores needing to always be even refueled as you're on the bike, you supplement it a ton. And so, uh, you know, for these athletes amongst the men's field, I'd say somewhere between 80 to 120 grams of uh, simple carbohydrates getting into the bloodstream somehow. So uh, I'd be taking throughout this at a longer effort like this, every 15 to 20 minutes, I'd be throwing something down or they're going to be doing some sort of a mixture in their bottle that they've really figured out to get the best what we call osmality in the stomach, the quickest uh, transfer of those sugars through the uh, gut into the bloodstream as fast as they possibly can. That's what it's all about. It's the name of the game because sugar equals ATP, which equals power in the muscles. Thank you, Dr. Guerra. I guess it's worth remembering as well that a lot of these riders we're seeing being hammered by an enormous fan. That means that you don't necessarily notice yourself sweating as much, do you? But that fan and the wind from it is immediately carrying away that sweat from your skin. So it's important to keep the fluid going in. I mean, how many bottles do you reckon? I mean, you, you could, could you neck a couple of 500 mil bottles during this? Easy. Yeah. I, I mean, I reckon I'd have thought so. Wouldn't you? I reckon so. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I mean, would... <laughs> uh, I, for if, if, if that was directed at me, not positive, but I would be going yeah. for at least three bottles, if not four bottles. I would wow. have I so yeah. be careful. I would have five bottles lined up here, and if I yeah. felt like yeah. dehydrated somehow or something just didn't work out right, and I needed to get a bunch of sugar in, the more water I'm throwing down, the better. Sometimes, so I I definitely am at least two to three bottles, at least. Oh, wow. Well, we've got to give a shout out to Johan Norin, the Swede, who is trying to ride his way across to Martins, our leader at the moment. Closing the gap a little bit. He's about halfway across it because the next rider chasing at the front is our world champion, Bjorn Andreasen. I still think that leading group, though, is a little bit smaller than it was when we last came off. I'm not sure we haven't lost a few riders, actually, going north of the river. Matt as well. Yeah, I, th I think we have. It certainly looks a lot smaller. It's been, as you'd expect for a race of this distance, just under 70 k's um, in and around the Surrey Hills here. Um, it's, it's attritional and those big efforts, not that many riders can, uh, can, can sustain the sort of power needed on repeated efforts. It's the, it's the real, as we talked about on many occasions, that the pure definition of fitness is the ability to, re to do repeated efforts and uh, the fitter the rider, the more efforts they can, they, can, they can maintain. And that's why it's important to keep your powder dry as well as be aggressive. But mm. uh, I'm just looking at the stats of Martin Martins on the front. He did indeed. I, I wasn't going, uh, going funny in the head. And Martin Martins did win on, on the Alpha Zwift earlier this year. But he can maintain this sort of effort. Um, he can ride for five minutes at six and a half watts a kilo uh, or 20 minutes, six watts a kilo. So, so the effort that he's putting out at the moment for Martins is more than sustainable. Um, and he's holding... 20 seconds in fact over the last couple of kilometers just across the river thames he's added three seconds to his total now so he's kind of matched the gap that we saw earlier on by the irish chap that, that went clear so he's got 20 seconds yep. now and uh, and martin's ability on a climb like this given his power is he's very good power to weight he's not just a rider that's built the gap with absolute power and is going to suffer on the climb. Martins can maintain this effort all the way up. And this is really interesting now. Um, I think it's quite likely he's going to take the points over the top. The big question remains is, will he continue with the effort over the top? Mm, let's watch it. If you've just recently tuned in and are watching this on our Zwift YouTube channel, my name's Jez Cox. They were the words there of Matt Stevens, former British road race champion and Zwift esports expert alongside but we also have Nathan Guerra here as well. We'll bring him back in in just a moment. You are watching the penultimate round of the Zwift Grand Prix, the second edition of the Zwift Grand Prix, where we bring together the best elite Zwift riders in the world, men and women. This is the men's race you're watching right now. This is the final ascent of Box Hill before we then head to a big finish line where every rider who's within five minutes of our leader, who is currently Martins, who are watching right now on the climb, uh, can score as long as they're within five minutes. This is our penultimate round. The women's race is due to start, well, not in the too distant future in actual fact. There'll be a little bit of an overlap, I believe. We'll update you on when the women's race actually starts. And, uh, of course, as soon as we can, and we've quickly rounded up the results of the men's race, we'll go straight to the women's race and bring you the action. They are doing exactly the same distance, as they kind of should be, as the men, of course. They're doing exactly the same course, same distance, and it's the same number of teams, 16 teams of five. We're looking down at Martin Martins now. Look at the effort on the front from uh, the rider from Toyota Elite. Let me remind you, that team is in fifth place right now. So his strike out here, a good opportunity to score big points and stay ahead of uh, Swedish Swifters rider Norin here, who is chasing him down. Look at the distance the rider's chasing him behind. It's a big gap as well. I think they're going to hang on by the looks of it, Matt. What do you reckon? I, I think there's a very good chance. And in uh, Norin, um, there was a little bit, there's a big acceleration by the peloton on the flat section, but uh, Norin actually dropped away. He's actually moving ever so slightly quicker. Uh, quicker. He, he's got him in his sights now. You can just see, we've got Martins on screen here, and just behind you can actually see the figure of Norin of Sweden closing the gap. Seven and a half seconds. Um, importantly, Martins, over the third place rider on the road, now has 26 seconds. And it was at this point that we saw uh, the lead diminish um, on what, a couple of laps ago. So, well, Martins is on an absolute flyer. Mm. And to be honest with you, you wonder if he maintains seven seconds over the top and that they keep their lead complete. I think it will come down by about six or seven seconds because of the acceleration. In, in fact, it's the third place yes. rider, Perrin, at yes. 26, and now 40 seconds. So <laughs> this is, this is wow. big. 
But if, if Norin and Martins get together over the top of this climb, I think from a tactical perspective, it might be good to bring in Nathan now. Because Nathan, fascinating stuff here, mate. Um, it looks like Martins is certainly going to take maximum points over the top. But given the situation behind him, even factoring in 15 seconds being taken back over the top, we could see an interesting duo here battling for the win. Yeah, I, I think really this is what we were talking about earlier because of the nature of this race and the attrition of it. Martin Martins, Johan Noren, they know each other really, really well when it comes to uh, races like this. And if you look behind how it, the story's playing out here, the reality of it is that there's riders that now see the danger of this that are looking to go across. They're thinking exactly what you just said, Matt. Thomas Perrin is now also saying, look, something's going up the road. We need to get on top of this. Somebody needs to get involved. Maybe it'll come back later. But next, they're like, if this stays, we need somebody there. Perrin's going now as well. We see Janot out there as well. It's going. It looks like Van Elster. There's definitely a worry in the back of the mind of a lot of these top riders in the peloton that a rider like Martins is going to stare away. What's interesting to me is I don't actually see... Where is Plantero to me? Where are some of these favorites? He's still trusting at this point, perhaps, or does he not have it today is a big question mark for me because I would have expected him to be one of those. Also, Lionel Viasen trusting. So there's two different mindsets here, it seems like. One within this pack that, no, it's not going to stay away. It'll come back together. And the other, like Perrin, Martins, going off the front here. I mean, there's there's definitely a whole nother, uh Noren as well saying, no, this is something to trust. I'm going for it. And I think Johan Noren, Martin Martins, they get together. That's definitely danger to stay away. And I think they will work together very well if, it de if they do end up together. Just one more question Thank you, Nathan. from me, Go Nathan. On. Just sorry, Jess. One more question from me. That's right. If you if you were, were Martin Martin's DS, would you say wait for Noren over the top? Yeah, I get the points, and I would one hundred percent say I, I get the points, and then once you got those points, like don't you know, no freebies out here. But I I would even you know not risk too much of Noren's energy actually even i would say look just get those points no obviously don't let him get within two seconds but over the top noren is the kind of rider you want with you he yeah, yeah. Ha this guy is top 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 level and you don't want to waste his energy you want to you know you want the gloves to come off with a k to go not right now right and at that point then you want to say hey we're not friends anymore but right now he needs a good friend because that pack behind has some high power in it stay away from him you need a friend out right out on course right now well, let's focus on the race to the top of Box Hill for the final time because Martins is so nearly there. Martin Martins has gone from an awfully long way out before we'd even crossed the river and gone under the escalator. He's only got to go around this corner. Noren is still seven seconds, but he's dropping his power up the best he can. I don't think it'll help him at all, of course, because he's got no one to draft. And Martin Martins is going to take the final points on the top of Box Hill. He has survived the German riding for Toyota Elite. He's made that one count, but boy, it could have been pretty close, and it still was close as well. Noren now goes through, uses his power up, despite the fact that it won't actually help him. And here comes the British rider, Tom Perrin, riding for the second-ranked team overall going into tonight, next eSports. Andreasen also dropping his power up to get some more points as well. So that's the, uh, the top three or four places gone now. I think the leading rider here might just pick up fifth spot for 35 points as well. Uh, so Martin Martins in first, Noren second, Perrin the British rider for next esports in third, Kaminski the Polish rider was for Coalition Alpha in fourth, the world champion Bjorn Andriessen picks up the 35 points for fifth place across the line. We are done with Box Hill for the men. Of course, we've got the women's race yet to come. They're taking in four ascents of it. It is now all about the run-in to the finish and trying to get riders I think quite crucially inside that five minute gap. And actually, I think, do you know, there's going to be more outside that five minute uh, time cut off than we even thought. I think there's going to be quite a lot of them, Matt. Yeah, definitely. I mean, e even this group behind Jez uh, have been spread out. The, the top 15, uh, there's big gaps in between them. Um, 30 seconds to the 15th rider on at the road. Um, but Martins isn't waiting at the moment. Although Nora is starting to close, he's not actually waiting. And um, we can just see the picture in picture there of our world champion a little bit further down. He's currently sat in fifth place. But Martins now gets into that aero super tuck, saves a couple of seconds. 
It looks like he's out of sight at the moment, um, especially at these sorts of speeds. The distance on the road stretched out, so uh, Noren won't be able to see him. But this is fascinating. They've got 20 seconds over Andreas and is broken clear. Dawson's not too far behind. But that chasing pack are really spread out. There's no real organisation. And of course, Jez, at this late in, this, in the race, a lot of riders won't have multiple teammates to help work. So that no. falls in the favour of our two leaders out in front. The big question for me is, can and will Noren get across? Um, and is Martins confident enough to ride this on his own? Um, uh, or is he going to wait for Noren? And right now, he's certainly not waiting at all. Uh, to use the words of uh, Pantani and Armstrong back in the day, no gifts. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, that was on Alp Duez itself, wasn't it? Not the Alp du Zwift. Um, <laughs> you're, you're, you're picking the quotes from the very top there as well. The Mountains is going to be enjoying this descent off the back of Box Hill, out of the Surrey Hills and heading back towards the River Thames to cross over it. Uh, they do cross back in this direction again one more time, as I say, but no more ascents of Box Hill. So really, it's a very tactical chase now as well. Application of steady watts to try and wind in that gap. And the gap, the gap is coming down though, Matt, definitely. Uh, Noren is still only six seconds behind Martins, but then the chasing pack is only 18 seconds behind. And I think we're going to gradually see that coming back as well. That is fascinating. Leading group of some, we think about 30 riders or so now, with most of the main protagonists in here. But teamwork in amongst them won't be too great. Next, eSports, as we can see from that shot, have at least three. No, they've got four riders in this leading group as do Abus Synergy. So the teams up amongst our very best, first and second place teams, have got most of their team there. I look to see whether we've got five for Abus Synergy. I don't think we have. I think there's just four in there. Next Esports have definitely got four too. So they are our two leading teams going into tonight's racing. So at this stage, Nathan, can I just bring you back in uh, again, if that's all right, just to get a tactically, tactical uh, perspective. I suspect where you are, you've got your jacket on. It's a bit warmer than that. I know you're right. You're getting warmed up and you're ready for the winning stage. It's very close to the start. But don't worry, take time. You're going to be sticking to that. I'm afraid if you are, you see the commander's face. It's too much. But uh, we, will be, uh, we will be bringing you that. But we will be we will be bringing you that. Nathan, yes, sorry. What I was going to ask you was... <laughs> If you're in that second group now, I guess if you're not too far back, is it is it a case of, well, make sure you save something so you can win a sprint from the... So when I say second group, the, the next big group on the road, is it about trying to make sure you maximise points from that? Or do you, do you, are you desperately chasing to try and get back in? I know it's probably a silly question, isn't it? Because everyone's desperately chasing to get, to get to the finish. Is there any team tactics that could come into play? Uh, everything... A lot, well, a lot comes down to this moment right here uh, because how they are able this moment and the other uh there will be one more time out of the underground and those two moments are going to be really really crucial to see how much time is actually brought back from that big punch at least in my mind if i'm off the front with this little um breakaway with Norton and martins i'm watching how motivated they are to continue with speed out of the underground because that's a massive amount of time that can be uh taken out of us because we're usually not going to be able to kick as high on our orange numbers and then continue on we're going to have to be a little bit more conservative because we're working continually on the front it's about brought, brought back down by a second or two now at this point, but they definitely backed off in that pack not to five watts per kilogram plus. So I'm watching continually what kind of motivation that they've got back there. Now, when you're in the pack and you start watching to see how motivated people are to actually start doing any work, that's the moments when you start going, well, everyone's pulling about 4.5 to five watts per kilogram or less. We have to start attacking if anything's going to happen here, actually. Like... And then it's and then it's a dice roll at that point. You're but you you got two, you you get two benefits then from attacking the pack. The pack's not working together. Our best bet at this point is to go, is to try and separate things out. And on top of that, what's going to happen is we're going to end up getting distance back on that on on those riders once we actually cause a breakaway. Let's start working together, and then we'll go get them back. So unless we start seeing one of these teams or two of these teams get into some major agreement and go, we'll just do work on the front, we don't care, make it happen, which I don't necessarily see happening, I think we're actually going to start seeing some crazy attacks like just now, orange numbers, and eventually the be a split 
or these two stay away. Those are our two options, I think. Thank you, Nathan. Now, it's interesting. So that's the last time through our start gantry there, which means they've now picked up the final power-up, the final draft power-up that they will have today. So now I guess it gets a little bit more interesting and, uh, and useful figuring out when you use that, because it's not a case of just using it up. And you can see uh, Martin's there. Martin Martin's using his to stay with Nora. Now, they've gone through the arch already, so that is the final power-up he'll have, unless I'm missing something, and he's used it there just to stay in the leading two. Yeah, it does look like he did deploy it there. A um, couple of little attacks just off the front from this group. But just Nathan was talking about the fact there's going to be lack of cohesion behind. They are going to try and chase, but increasingly, as each of these kilometers ticks by, and we're primarily on flat roads here, no more a sense of Box Hill. There's a couple of little punches as Harvard Glednez of Movistar tries his luck, and in the process is taken the gap down to 15 seconds but um, with the riders relaying on the front at the moment Martin is on the front at six and a half watts a kilo Norend sat tightly on his wheel is doing three watts a kilo less so they're relaying and able to put out six and a half watts and that means for them the riders behind to shut down the gap they've, they've got to be putting out more power uh, and I think we're going to see an increasing lack of cohesion behind but more and more attacks as riders try and get off the front that way but right now I think it's advantage Norin and Martins but still with 8.6 k's to go the game isn't over um, and they need to start well they need to continue to do what they're doing now and just hope that that brittle alliance or hard, a lack of alliance behind actually falls in their favor but we could see somebody one of the big hitters from behind, try and go solo and bridge across the gap. But 14 seconds alone is a hard thing to do with no climb. So Martins on at the front here. Very, very important that Norin uh, tries to stay as close as he can here. And at this point in the race, um, uh, Nathan, it's really this is where the real skill at feathering power and, and riding close to the wheel comes in isn't it this is a critical part of the race eight k's to go but if you just drift off the wheel a bit too much you're spending so much energy but uh, this is where that real skill at riding on zwift and feathering the power comes into play doesn't it oh 100 percent. you know the ability to draft out on zwift and knowing uh, how to get exactly where you need to be. This is where I always like to say view three, view three. If you push number three on your keyboard or you go through the views on the companion app and you get to that first person point of view where it actually is like as if you are in the avatar's eyes, I like to use that the most because it gives me um, exactly what I need to know whether or not I'm perfectly on that wheel and there isn't kind of this third person laid back camera where I'm sat in a place where I don't necessarily know that I'm right on the wheel. And so that helps me out a lot actually to make sure I'm getting the best draft as I possibly can. I'd actually be interested to know the percentage. Uh, you know, if we did a, a poll of how many of the riders use view three versus uh, view one, view one on the keyboard or the third person point of view that's m removed away and what they think about that for getting the best draft because man, view three versus that view one for me uh, is is massive difference, and I think I lose a little bit of that percentage on the draft if I don't use one or the other. Nathan, that is that is fascinating to hear. I must admit, on the on the brief number of times I've raced on Zwift, I've I've found it I've preferred the more slightly more distant view. But I see what you mean, not knowing quite where the other and being that particularly with the way that the the uh, the dynamics of the game have changed in the last few months, where the drifting has become, is drafting, sorry, has become even more accurate and important. That makes a lot of sense to me. So, just just while we're watching these guys getting closer to the final five kilometres, Nathan, I'm conscious we're right at the beginning. It's January, right at the beginning of the year. A lot of people might be just starting out on Zwift. What what is your, what have you got? Any other big tips for 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 uh, making the most of moving up through the uh, through the levels and, and that's a, obviously a good one make sure you're drafting properly and anything else you can give to us any tidbits well moving up to the levels there's all <laughs> kinds of little xp stuff that's happening but when it comes to racing tips i mean watching these sections of course that we're watching right now I mean, as you can see, we said a little bit earlier, they were not going to be able to match the big orange numbers because they're continually reducing the energy stores that they have to be able to push. And so they're not reserved up like we see from Nair and Dawson and Harris and the others that have just punched a big orange numbers, as we like to call them, up in that 10, 
you know, watts per kilogram or so, that's brought back five seconds very quickly. So those are going to be the crucial moments to watch for out on a course. And whether or not you're gaining or losing there is whether or not you need to invest any longer in a breakaway like this. Because that was brought back so quickly right there and there was that motivation, in a moment here, we're going to see whether or not these two stay motivated in this breakaway because they're going to start thinking how much more is going to come back once we get into the underground because they're going to descend again, and that pack is probably going to go faster than they do even through the underground because in the downhill, yeah. and then once they climb again, there's a really big chance of being caught actually there. We may see motivation go out real quickly amongst these two. Yeah. Nathan, Nathan, Matt, I think I know the answer to this. Can I ask you both of you, are they going to stay away, those two, with 5K to go? What do you reckon, Nathan? Ooh. Matt, I, I don't. I, I, the 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 chances are low. The, much lower right now. Much lower. Much yeah. much lower right now. There's a lot of motivation behind. Yeah, I think there's a lot of motivation behind. The gaps come down. It's under 10 seconds now. And just reiterating what Nathan said, you know, on the flat. Um, it's harder to bring the time gap unless you've got a team relaying on the front. But on that little drag that we saw up to up to the monument there, that if you go hard on a drag like that, you can you can eat into the time. And and going through the underground, I think they're going to need maybe 15 seconds to stay away. It's stabilised at the moment at 10 seconds. Although there's not one team on the front, but I do think the death knell for our two leaders, if there were to be one, will come in the underground. And, and one thing that as well, when you've just got two runners out in front, when you're doing a team time trial on Swift or relaying on the front as a team, you're in communication, you can talk to each other. Of course, Nora and Martins, they're working together, but they can't talk. So it's that nuance on Swift they're having to rely on. Um, and the gap coming down again, seven seconds now to Bouillasan and Plantereux, who are trying to chip across the gap here. What a thrilling finale this is. Yeah, the Belgian and the Frenchman trying to get across that gap. It is coming back, but I tell you what, remember they've got to go all the way along the edge of the embankment, then across the river, under the river again, turn around at the bottom of um, Box Hill and go back on themselves. And this leading group is getting smaller and smaller under all these little attacks as well all the time. Let's remind ourselves, Matt, this is the important thing we need to think about. Right now, going into this final sprint where the winner can score 300 points, Wahoo Lokol are leading on 300 points for tonight, okay? Now, don't forget, those points, putting us out to people at home, they don't correlate, they don't, are not added to the series points, but the leading team at the end of the night will get 35 points. Aber Synergy were our leading team going into this evening. They're currently sitting in third place. OK, so actually, if it stays as it is and Wahoo Lacole take the win, they're sitting on the win at the moment going into this final sprint. We'll watch out for those pink and blue jerseys of Wahoo Lacole. They serve to move right up, I think. They're in currently in fourth place. But a 35-point win could see them move up possibly to third or even second place going into next week's final round. So it is so close. I know people at home would expect us to say that, but it is really close. And we've got Swedish Swifters and Toyota Elite represented in these leading two. Now, if they stay clear, they've got a chance to win 300 points, which is, which is as much as any other team has scored all evening so far. It just goes to show how important this final sprint is, Matt, isn't it? Oh, oh definitely. But it's uh, it's coming I mean, 3.3 Ks to go. So we've got about on a four and a half minutes of effort, maybe five minutes tops. Uh, and they're not going to relent. This is that little bit that we're coming up to that Nathan was just talking about. Back into the underground. Uh, thankfully, our engineers at Zwift have put some boards over the railway tracks just to make it a bit safe. But in a few minutes' time, well, sorry, in about 30 seconds' time, we're going to swing right onto that brutally steep little kicker up the escalator, which is about 13, 14%. And Martins and Norin are still clear, but they've only got five and a half seconds over Daniel Turek and Perrin close behind. This is a critical point in the race now. Yeah, we'll watch that moving up that we were discussing before, the finessing and moving up through that group to be ready for this final sprint. Uh, so close uh, to being caught now. Just over five seconds, that pack led by the Czech rider Turek for the uh, next eSports team, Dan Turek, heading up that group. And they're so close to catching him. You can see them just at the top of the escalator. What do they do now, Matt? Do they just pause and wait? We know how strong Noren and Martins are, but are they going to have anything left for this final sprint? Two and a half K to go as well. Yeah, it's just the momentum, is it? There they are. It's just the momentum, as Nathan was saying earlier on. It's to speed up the climb and, and the additional momentum. If you're moving a slower up, 
the, up that steep climb, you just don't carry the speed over the top. And that is what's happened. And they're about to be caught. One and a half seconds in closing. There's the peloton behind. I think the time of Noren and Martins is about to be, uh, well, completely gone. Well. And they are going to be caught <laughs> as they head over the Thames. 2.2 k to go. And it looks as if finally they're going to be taken back. And there is the moment. It's the world champion, Jez, that brings them back together. Oh, Bjorn Andreasen, who, of course, when he won that world championship, did it all solo for so long. People thought he would be caught, but he hung on out there, just knocking out that tempo out front, the former mountain biker. And, of course, he's still wearing that world champions jersey right now. He'll get to wear that all the way through to uh, nearly the end of this year as well. Zach Nair goes over the top as well. Now the attacks start to roll once everyone's back in there. We've got a leading group of some 20 or so riders. Most of the biggest names in here in the world of Zwift race. And Andreasen has looked so good and so solid throughout this, hasn't he? Once again, he reels back in Zach Nair and just continues to lead at the front. He's, uh, I'm sure he'd love to ride away in the way that he did in those World Championships. But don't forget, this is not a scratch race. This is a points race. So much has been done so far. We've just seen the last two caught. But let's not forget, the two who were caught were our first and second place, Martins and Noren, over the last ascent of Box Hill. So they've not just played their part, but they've played it in a big way. And they're still in this group as well. They certainly are. This is absolutely fascinating. 1,300 metres to go. We've got a group of, I think, about 25 riders, if that, coming towards the finish. It won't be long before they can see the Flamme Rouge. It's going to come down to a little bit of a sprint, or is it? I think the, the riders who don't fancy the sprint, happy to go early. And we've had a surge. Daniel Turek, not a known sprinter. Panazza as well, but Castelli has gone early as well. Plantura, who's uh, come second on the streets of London a few rounds back, also in the mix. Buyasan are moving up through to the front. We've got 900 metres to go here, Jez. What a scintillating finale as the oh, Italian gets it's... caught by the Belgian. Planiza, and then going over the top. This is where anyone who's got that power up, the draft power up left in there, can use that to slingshot themselves through the group. And Harris, the Australian, for uh, BL13 has done exactly that. What a ride by uh, Josh Harris. We saw him on the attack earlier. He's timed this one brilliantly, Matt. Can he hang on, though? He's only got three seconds lead, Josh Harris. Wow, oh, this what is a, a ride this is by one the, of the longest. This is amazing. 500 metres to go, Jez, but I tell you what, it's a very long 500 metres, if I can say that, but he's still clear. He's got four seconds, Jez. My goodness, they're riding straight towards the gates of Buckingham Palace. He's on the red tarmac. Can he hang on in the middle of the road? The Aussie, everyone's dropping the power-ups. Here we go. Oh, he's there right in front of them. You can see the finish arch as well. I think he's going to do it, Matt. Right on the line, I think. Look at that. Harris is... <laughs> well, Harris has hung oh. on. That was, that was it. I yep, do apologise. Yep. I'm just literally checking the actual finish gantry. What a ride by the Aussie in the colours of BL13. The team who are in 10th place or were in 10th place going into tonight, he's just scored them 300 points on the night. So despite the fact we've not really been mentioning BL13, they're going to be right there, up there. In fact, they are, if I make that correct, Matt, my, my, even my maths can work that out. I don't know how many points Wahoo Lakol have scored there. We'll have a look down. When we get to it, we will bring you all of this, folks, once we've ratified it and checked it. And I'm pleased to say it won't be me ratifying a check it because I am a mathematical numpty, as we both know, Matt, only too well. Um, but he's just scored 300 points for that finale, which was the same number of points that Wahoo Lakal, our leading team, was sitting on anyway. So if they yeah, didn't score any uh, points, but they will have scored points because everyone who finished scored points. But yeah, um, well, Bjorn B B B B Andreasen was third. Yeah, so B the, our world yep. champion was third. We'll get confirmation of that in a minute, but it will obviously go mm. down the count. But as you said, because of the amounts of, uh, of, of, of points that are scored, in fact, I think we do have a result that has uh, come through Oof. on the night, an initial result. But uh, I'll leave that for you to talk yep. about. But what yep. what an individual win. That has to be a season highlight for BL13, powered by Level Bello. He used that yep. power up to devastating effect. But that was a hard 40 second run into the line. I mean, but a perfectly timed move. But that was super, super strong. Mightily impressive win by Harris. Yes, what a great race. Now, let's not forget our women are getting underway. We will bring you folks at home, don't worry, particularly if you've tuned in fairly recently, which you're ready to cheer on a, a fan or a, maybe even a family member, someone you know. You might even be in the same room or same house as someone who's about to race in the women's Zwift Grand Prix here at the Epic Points Race. We will be bringing you that race imminently, but we will, of course, keep updating you on the ratified final results, even the provisional results as we get them of the men's 
points race. Matt and I are looking at a provisional points table, but I think we'll hold back on that until yeah. our engineers bring <laughs> it up on the screen. Rather, I'm quite good at putting my foot in things, and I don't want to do that here in the, the Premier Swift Racing League. Tell you what, though, Matt, why don't we have a look at those women's teams uh, before we get into their racing too? Remember that folks at home, they're doing exactly the same distance, exactly the same course. Matt, let's start working our way through these women's teams, shall we? Indeed. Well, uh, as the men's, it's with the mirroring, the 16th place team is pretty more uh, racing without borders there in 16th. Still looking, I think, at trying to move up there. Castelli, of course, uh, we've got um, oh, the team, of course, normally in the men's, ridden by a, 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 a colleague with Nathan Guerra. And of course, We've got uh, Sophie Giovanni, Martina Erovec, uh, Seleni Colombi, Emilia Bottini and Roberta Borsoni as well. Rocco Corbe Collective, a team also wanting to try and move up nearer towards the top 10 if they can. Julie Cass, Bruce Doyne and Kat Ridgway, uh, a couple of key riders from them. And then BL13, well, can they can they do the same as the men today? Jay Harris taking the individual win, but I tell you what, that is going to void their spirits. What can the team of Anderson, Bonifacci, Maya, Murray and Trudin do? after uh, that wonderful win by Harris this evening. Absolutely. Uh, let's see how, how BL13 can be lifted by that last lap performance. On to Beast Mode, the all-German team. <coughs> excuse me. And they're getting better. They're moving up too. 26 of their 31 points were scored just in the last two rounds. So that is a German team very much with the ascendancy, the wind in their sails. Abus Synergy, unlike the men team who went into this evening leading, their women's team are sitting in 11th place. Uh, they had their best round in the team time trial, so their combined strength together is excellent. Let's see if they can put that to fine work in this points race tonight. Let's see. Next, eSports in 10th place and consistently sitting mid-pack all the way through the Zwift Grand Prix this winter. Um, they were let down by a weak scratch race, though, in round four. So let's hope that doesn't happen again for a team that has some very strong riders in there. Liz Van Howling, probably the strongest of them, but let's see tonight, shall we? Movistar sitting in ninth, just inside that uh, bottom half, if you like, of our teams. They had that fantastic points race in round three, didn't they? But it's been very quiet since. So let's see if the points race format is something that can rally the Movistar women's team tonight. Indeed. Let's have a look at the next so, page. Indeed. Well, uh, Saris, um, Gabriela Guerra is there, a rider that I know one person amongst our team will be cheering on, that is for sure. She's uh, going to be racing only a few feet away from Nathan. Um, and they're currently sit pretty solidly there in eighth place. Our Toyota Elite, um, looking at a rider there, Lucy Harris, might like a course like this. Then we've got Team Swedish Zwifters who've got a very, very good team. They always have a led, I think, on a course like this by Anna Embring. They're currently in sixth place. And then 2024, currently sat in fifth place. Um, Melissa Rollins, Laura Quinones, Miriam Packett, Emma Langley and Medel Kuntz are the team that I think will definitely be eyeing moving up in to uh, fourth place today. But they've got 40, the 14 points behind the Wahula Coles that might be a big ask for them. Hmm, let's see. So moving on to our top four, just as with the men, Wahoo Lakol are in fourth place. So they're very even with their men's team at the moment. Let's see if they can change that this evening, though. They're a team on the up, Wahoo Lakol, for the women, too. In their last four rounds, they've got 16 points, 20 points, and then two rounds where they've scored 28 in both, up on the podium as well. So they're definitely in the ascendancy. Can they carry that through to 2024? Let's see. Exagon, the French team, are sitting in third, and they're just five points off second right now as well in third place. They were winners of the Mountain points race, don't forget, when Sandrine Etienne went off by herself and hoovered up mountains of points. Can she do the same thing here? That will be really interesting to see how the French woman Sandrine Etienne chooses to use uh, the slopes of Box Hill. I think she could do it, Matt. Well, let's watch, shall we? Let's see. Second place is last year's winner, Aeonian. 
Uh, it's currently in second, and I'm sure they'll look to try and get back on top if they can over the next two rounds. They were winners of the team time trial last round as well. They won the last round. So can they use that strength in numbers to close the gap at least to Coalition Alpha? Coalition Alpha, of course, are our leading team led by their DS, Rhys Howell. Sitting pretty at the top as they have done since November. But can they hang on as the attacking starts today? And how much, I wonder, Matt, will they have to rely on Lou Bates, who has been an absolute powerhouse for them, particularly in the points races? Yep, they've got such that a will be. good team. They, as is it, yeah, definitely. And also Mary Wilkinson. I know she's been out on a bike getting the hours in of late in the cold conditions. And I think she'd prefer a longer attritional race. But uh, yeah, they've got a really versatile squad. But they are the team to beat, quite clearly. Right, well, while we wait to bring you the men's result, and don't worry, folks at home, we will have that for you as soon as we can uh, double and triple check it. We'll bring it to you right here. Let's check in on the event format, though. I said it's exactly the same as the men's, but it was quite a while ago when we started that men's 69.7 kilometre race, so we'll remind you what it is. We are on the PRL London Half, or London PRL Half Course, as I say, 69.7. Let's call it 70k between friends. It is four laps of this London course where we go north of the river, through the start line, and then we dip south of the river, and we go to Box Hill in Surrey, or what would be Surrey, but it's South London, Box Hill in South London. Up Box Hill, at the top of Box Hill, there are points for the first riders across it on each of the four laps. 150, 75, 50, 40, and 35 points, as you can see there on the screen, every time across it. There's those power-ups available when you go back through the start line and over the top of Box Hill, and they are the draft power-up, which increases is your draft for 40 seconds so the format's exactly the same as for the men and uh, i think we're ready to bring you some of the live action as well uh, this is the race points so far by the looks of it and we'll be able to bring you up to speed with exactly where in the race we are so by the looks of it then we've already gone through over the top of box hill once and it, uh, we did wonder I think we did wonder, and no, sorry, I do apologise, we are now bringing you the race points from the finish line. Let me start that again, shall we? Matt, you jump in if you notice I'm talking a load of rubbish, which I often do. These are, of course, the yeah, finish line the points yeah. for our final sprint. I was looking thinking, hang on a minute, what's going on here? I do apologise, it's been quite a long evening already. Yes, this was the finish, wasn't it, of the, the men's race last time across the line. And Harris, the uh, the Aussie, getting that fantastic 300 points as well. There was the uh, top 10. Anyone stand out for you guys in there, Matt or, or maybe Nathan, that uh, we didn't mention that was in there? We're rolling down through the 20th, so we get to see who was in that group in the end. Yeah, no, I think it's just a grouping of the riders. You can see 12th, 13th, 14th there for Abus. Um, so they've grouped well, but nobody in the top 10. Um, but uh, the team, and we'll get the, the team rankings in a bit, the team that stood out for me in terms of getting multiple riders scoring lots of points was Next Esports. Three inside that the uh, the upper reaches of the top 10 there. Yeah, we did, uh, we did keep mentioning, didn't we, that Next Esports were always there or thereabouts, very evident in that leading group too. So... They've had a good night. It will be interesting to see the effect of that on the team points. Uh, don't forget, we'll be able to give you a tally of all the team points scored on the night. And the team that has the highest points will score 35 series points. And uh, certainly, Matt, from what I'm seeing in the provisional scoring, and we'll bring you that as soon as we can. It could be an interesting shuffle this evening. But don't forget, this is going into next week's Points Hunter going to be absolutely mega let's see what it's done let's bring the race points up the team points on the night and there it is next esports we kept mentioning how many numbers they still had in that leading group and that's what it does for you 946 points on the night to next esports our team who started the night in <laughs> he says second place weren't they of course wahoo lacole had that fantastic race in the uh, in the epic points hunt they're in second 934 toyota elite e-cycling in third they were in fifth place going into the night so we'll see what that does to the standings overall then it's coalition alpha hexagon bl13 sitting on 532 points to add to the that's on that's uh, including the 300 of our final uh, finishing line win of course food upon shows coalition had a good night as well uh in eighth place ahead of movistar team swedish swifters uh, Castelli Elite, Restart, I should say, and then uh, Beast Mode, Deepak, and Saris down on no points. A bad night 
for the uh, for the riders in white and pink. So that's our 16 teams for the men. We're going to bring you now, I believe, a little bit of a replay of the action so far in the women's race. And, uh, and then shortly after that, we'll be able to join it live, of course. Let's have a look. So these are our leading women. What will be interesting to see is how much it's whittled down early on, as we can see. Early attackers as well looking to get clear. And uh, this is back on the streets of North London, of course. So I am presuming this is on the opening lap as well, heading out to Box Hill for the first time. My suspicion is they've taken in Box Hill already, but we'll bring you up to speed with that in, uh, in just a moment. And the early attacker from Exegon. And that is uh, Marine Mouji. And just being real back in and no surprise there. The colours of Aeonian and Coalition Alpha bossing the front end of this. I'm um, I'm wondering, Matt, watching these pictures, whether we might see those two teams in particular, Aeonian and Coalition Alpha, just start to snuff things as well. Right. Well, talking of them. Coalition Alpha with one rider going over the top. I can't actually see from this shot who it is, but they've definitely got one rider who's... Uh, it's Lou Bates. There we go. <laughs> I did uh, wonder how much they might lean on the shoulders of Lou Bates, and she is at it already, scoring the first 150 points over the top of Box Hill, and our leading team, Coalition Alpha, once again using the strength of the British rider. These are live pictures, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the penultimate round of the Zwift Grand Prix for the women... This is the epic points race. One sprint point down, three to go, plus the finish line. Matt, Coalition Alpha are at it again. Oh, they certainly are. Uh, they're such a strong team. And the thing is, it, it's, they're just so versatile. They can perform well on, on all sorts of terrain. And, and you called it at the top of the show when we're going through the, the riders, Lou Bates, but clearly has got great legs. And uh, very much like the men's race, this is going to be a completely different proposition. I think the women will have been um, watching keenly to see how the men's race here unfolded. Not so much for the tactics used, but just the way that the peloton quite quickly was diminished so some of the bigger teams here will try and put a lot of pressure on on some of the teams that they fear just to try and whittle it down and, that, and in the process giving getting riders out of the back i mean the the gap for the men's race in terms of rider scoring points any anybody who finished inside five minutes scored uh, it's seven minutes for the women's race as we look at uh, harris just setting that tempo on at the front teammate just behind her and that was Nord's main. But no, um, I think they'd have learned a lot about the men's race. But it, again, again, because this is so so new, it could be completely different. But one thing I am expecting, and no doubt Nathan will think the same thing, uh, I'm expecting this to be very attritional and a reduced group going through to the finish. And already, second time up Box Hill, um, yeah, there's a lot of riders already out the back. Yeah, this is, uh, well, we've got, what, two more switchbacks before they get to the very top. And this is now much more, uh, well, tactical. They're not riding easy by any means. If you look at the watts per kilo, there's a lot of riders knocking around the five watts per kilo mark here. So they're not sitting back just watching each other cautiously. But there's not a big attack being thrown down right now. Awful lot of riders in play. But just, while, while we're watching this, both, I guess, Matt and Nathan, either of you, we talk about, well, they've been watching and they, might, they will have learned some stuff from the men's. I know things are slightly different. You know, the, the, the pack dynamics are different between the men and the women. We often talk about this. But what is there, is there anything they'll have learned from watching the men there? Nathan, what do you reckon? What, what could they have picked up on? Uh, I think um, the reality of being able to bring something back if the pack is large enough. But I th like Matt just said, this is going to be a very different story, I think, because you're going to get a lot more separation. There's some standout riders here who, as the race goes on, I think will start to form a much smaller breakaway group. Um, you know, we're looking at, you know, Hill is here at the NEA. Uh, you know, Gallegos, at least Gallegos, is a big standout in the last month or so, and she's got new confidence. I'd be watching out for her as well. Obviously, Lou Bates for Haran. So there's some names here from multiple teams, I think, that will start to see uh, rising to the top of this climb. 
you know, going into the back end of this and, and maybe see a little bit different, as Matt said, proposition. Uh, it's, it's hard to, to say, like, there's a little bit of something to learn from, but they race so differently and the, the, the talents are really, really different across it. So sometimes it's hard to kind of fit those puzzles together. I think just, a, just off the back of that, Nathan, as well, with uh, we're coming towards the top of this climb, but uh, already Coalition Alpha, courtesy of, of the points on offer, uh, 150 points um, for the, you. can just see the, the point score on the screen there. Uh, Aeonian, 110. Movistar, 50. Toyota Elite, of 40. So that's the points so far. Uh, and it won't be long before we come round to the top of the climb. But uh, it, it, the different thing we've seen, we saw Lou Bates attacking on lap one. And then every time on the climb in the men's race, we saw an individual attacker at some point. But here, it looks like we could get a more of a sprint um, towards the top of the climb rather than a solo attacker. So already, Jez, there's a different sort of dynamic to the way that the pack are actually uh, tackling Box Hill. That is interesting, isn't it? It's, um, do you know, I, I often, I think I often say this, and I'm, I'm not afraid to say it, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not out to upset people. This is just my own take of it. I, I think, and they're massively generalizing, between male and female racers in real life and in Zwift, things are quite different. But I still think sometimes there's something about the, the, the sort of too many of the men where they're quite happy to throw it down and take a risk. And there are probably more women. I'm just I'm generalizing here. Right. So, so tell me to shut up and I'm talking nonsense, Matt. But I think there probably are more women, certainly in cycling, that will be a little bit more cautious. What I'm saying is too many of the men are like meatheads and the women are probably a little bit more sensible. Or one who isn't, though, is Lou Bates because she's doing it again. Look at this. Yeah, big, she's got big, so much power. Out. Yeah, she really has. She's so, so confident. Um, she's opened up a gap already of uh, one and a half seconds over Koisin and Optiota Elite E-Cycling. Another coalition. Mary Wilkinson isn't too far away. So already Coalition Alpha, they're dominating the league so far. And already, second time up, they're dominated again. Whew, what a ride by Bates. Looks like Wilkinson in second there, Jez, as well. Wow. Both the two... two British hill climb specialists in real life, absolutely bossing it as well, really using Box Hill and their strength in eSport and Zwift to their absolute best. I, at the moment, Matt, if it carries on like this, Lou Bates could take all four of these because she is peerless at that stage. Bearing in mind it's her teammate who's in second as well. That is very impressive. Yeah, and uh, that sort of effort as well is going to put just a, another handful of riders out the back as well, slowly but surely whittling this lead group down but somebody's taking the opportunity to go over the top here from castelli colombi has gone gone clear this is that little bit that we were talking about earlier on the second little step up you go through the finish uh, line at box hill but the road actually continues up even steeper it's quite cruel actually but she's been uh, caught by a lizzie harris just rolling through yeah. there after that little bit of attempt Vaharan is there as well but no, a, a dominant, dominant start by Coalition Alpha. But points so far, two more ascents of this climb. Coalition Alpha, 375 points to Ionians, 110. More than double, wow. triple, in fact, the point score. And we're only half distance. Talk about having raised their game, Coalition Alpha. I'll just remind people that in last year's inaugural Zwift Grand Prix, Coalition Alpha finished 10th at the end of the whole series. Aeonian, who are sitting in second right now, both on the day and in the series, were our winners, okay? Coalition Alpha have absolutely lifted everything about the way they do this and what a combination of strength they have here. Uh, particularly, I mean, we're talking as two British commentators here, Matt. We're completely impartial, of course, but it's the British spine of that team, particularly like we're seeing today, Mary Wilkinson and Lou Bates, who are just seemingly perfectly made for Zwift, those two. And it's no surprise, is it? We've mentioned this before. In real life, they're both, uh, I think they might both be former national hill climb champions. They're both brilliant hill climbers. And, and it turns itself so well to these kind of efforts, doesn't it? Yeah, it certainly does. It's pretty worth, I think it's worth bringing Nathan here. Of course, uh, Mary Wilkinson as well has won on all different sorts of terrain. Is again, a proper OG when it comes to racing on Zwift, a former Zwift Academy finalist. But Nathan... One thing that Coalition have got, as well as strength and depth, is they're smart, aren't they, as well? So when you have strong riders and you, you, you race smart and you race with skill, that gives you another edge as well. With Reese Howell at the helm, with that much power and, and under the hood, once you combine that um, 
that kind of uh, tactical intelligence, it's pretty devastating, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. And, and the reason being there also is bike racing is all about m there's moments right there's those moments in when the race is really decided and you've got to really reserve that power for those moments and it, it's kind of like you could have this engine all day long you know and and have all of this you know prowess but at the end of the day if you just waste it out on course it's not going to do a whole lot for you whereas you know there, there's definitely like this this whole pendulum of that right like we're not really that experienced all the way to like okay extremely experienced that can accelerate it and exponentially take the energy that you have to use it to your advantage against your your adversaries out there so i think you know it's definitely something to speak to when you talk about lou bates mary wilkinson um who else is out here riding for coalition i mean this is some of the og as it gets you know they've yeah. been around <laughs> since the beginning and they've got some uh, they've know this course from the first times we ever had a broadcasted race of it actually so it's, it's spe specifically wilkinson uh you know so with that kind of experience they know exactly when to go down to the meters a lot of times on a course like this uh, it's something I'm that, just not yeah, it's so, sorry Jess yeah and I was just saying I just 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 uh, thank you for that Nathan I've just noticed once again in this points racing format is Mika Soderstrom the Swedish rider for Movistar who's the only Movistar rider in this leading group they do rely heavily on her the Movistar team but I could see her quite easily scoring some big points in this world but she's the only Movistar rider left in a leading group of what is that I can probably count it because it's pretty small. It's around about 18 to 20 riders at the most of the 80 riders that started. It's really broken up, as we thought it might, Matt, very early, hasn't it? Yeah, we knew it would be attritional, um, but this has broken up a little bit more than I thought. But the pace they were going up the climb, uh, I don't think it was a matter of nobody wanting to attack. I just think the pace was set, was that high that nobody actually could attack, apart from Lou Bates, who left it to the last 200 metres. And this little this little section here, as they come out of the underground, a lot of runners are just dropping these power-ups. They'll get another one in about a mile or so's time as they go through the arch. This is like a moment to recuperate a little bit. You'll just see the power's dropped off a little bit, under four watts a kilo here. So an opportunity to get rid of your power-up, save some energy in the process, and this little second group I've got a second bite of the cherry. 40 k's Ooh, to yes. go now, so 25 miles. This little group just getting back on. Um, but the thing is, if you've been dropped at this stage, you're going to you possibly, unless you have a real second win, you're going to get up next time. Uh, but all of these riders that have just got back on now have another chance at suffering the way over Box Hill as Monique Lee Keller now clips off the front for Ionian. Yeah, just off the front. But this is a, I think some of this is a combination of seeing these power-ups being used now, the draft power-ups, before they get back to that start line again and pick up another one. So some of them giving them a really useful burst to uh, to click, click clear. We're following, or following just behind the leading rider, but things very, very close at the front of that pack, just a couple of seconds in it. Um, two more ascents of Box Hill to come. And then that vital finish as well, which carries points for everyone that finishes within seven minutes of the leader. So a little bit more lenient than in the men's race, where we saw a lot of riders outside that five-minute cutoff. Seven minutes for the women. And uh, so far, I haven't seen anyone, anyone near that. But I think we will be getting some near it, because some big gaps very, very early on. Hexagon have a rider, or Hexagon, as Matt reminded me to say, in the lead. They sit. Let's remind ourselves, they sit in third place, the French team, racing in the orange. And this is Marine Mouget, who is in the lead. We've already seen her in the, on the attack today as well. So they're definitely not relying too heavily on Sandrine Etienne. In actual fact, dare I say it, Matt, I don't think I've mentioned Sandrine Etienne's name so far. And look at this. She is in that group. We can see it. She's seven seconds down on Mouget. But maybe Etienne waiting. Yeah, it could she be. that incredible... Um... Mm. No, no, she, yeah, she did. Just, just an interesting move here. Just puts pressure on the other teams. And as we've only got a smaller peloton here, why not try something? Why not try and just test? I think on a on a course like this, as we were talking about in the men's race, it's a it's a race where you can actually take a few risks, try some different things. Some stuff might not stick. 
others might. Um, some riders might look at this race and approach it with caution because of the distance. Remember, it's just under 70 kilometers, which is a long, long way on Swift. Mm. But what that opens the door to is to riders who are brave to, to go for it and, and just try and get a little bit of a breakaway early on. And you just never know. And, and I, do, I do think like anything, fortune favors the brave, but by the same token, you don't want to be reckless. But I do think this course, this profile, the fact we've got a smaller amount of riders left um, if you're feeling good, why not give it a nudge? And it might just dr draw the sting from elsewhere. And you never know, you might get yourself in a little group. But saying that, um, another couple of ascents of the climb. It's still a long way to go on this one. Nathan, can I just bring you in? Because I'm suspecting, even though you've still got your jacket on, if things might be hotting up in that room because we're watching your wife, Gabby, <laughs> in the pink and white of Saris. She's just gone on the attack there to close things up. I think we can just hear a bit of a whirring in the background as she's knocking out, well, I can tell you what she's knocking out. At the moment, around about somewhere between three and a half, four watts. I know you're not going to give away anything in terms of tactics, Nathan. You're not that stupid. But how is she, how's she going tonight? I presume she might not be able to hear you. How is she going and, and, and what might we see her do? You know, um... She's not feeling, you know, her uh, system seems a little <laughs> bit better at uh, keeping the sickness up, but I think there may be a little bit of something still in the, she, her heart rate's a lot higher than usual tonight, so she's kind of like, uh, and then, then, all of a sudden, two laps in, when I'm like, yeah, just hang on then tonight, just hang on, we find her off the front, so I don't know, I don't, I don't know what's going on now, I'm just, honestly, with Gabby, but uh, we'll see uh, how she continues to play it. I have a feeling, you know, she is one who's got um, a lot of endurance. She is an athlete who rides the bike a lot, and in a race of attrition, I think that uh, it starts to favor her the longer the race goes. Um, so we'll see if, uh, if that ends up playing out for her, if she doesn't feel like she has as much of a kick tonight. So uh, other than that, I, you know, I'll see if I can get into her head a little bit more for everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Nathan. Wish her well from us, of course. We will keep an eye on her. She's right at the beginning of the pack there. Talking of heart rate, of course, you can see uh, Gabby Guerrero's heart rate there. And currently 154 beats per minute as she's knocking out just around about three watts per kilogram right now. As that pack reforms, just musters themselves a little bit more. She has her teammate, Eleanor Wiseman, the Belgian rider in that very multinational Saris team in that leading group. The rest of them are in the groups behind in this very, very select leading group. So, Matt, things have looked like they've just calmed down a little bit as we look at the numbers now. Yeah, and uh, Morge, as you were just talking, as Nathan was just uh, just talking there, Morge of the the squad that's uh, just gone clear. It's about been caught. Um, so that little foray off the front, it was a tentative little attack. She's now been brought back, but as we just pan out a little bit, as we just go along in our westerly direction, along the River Thames before we head back into Surrey again, that group has swelled, but still, I think there's probably only about 40, 45 riders left with still two laps to go. Stephanie Sidlick moved through to the front. It just shows how hard it is to actually try and snap the elastic on a race like this, but it might have been the best move. Maybe Morger was expecting somebody to come across, uh, but often, when you've been sat in good, quite often, when you put your nose in the wind, it's a gentle reminder of how hard it is to try and go solo. So perhaps she thought better of it and just slotted herself back in to the group for the Exagon squad. Yeah, we're looking at Swedish Swifters right now. And uh, Berglund is their only rider in this leading group. The team who sit, and that could be a problem for them, they sit in sixth place going into tonight's racing. They could do with scoring some decent points. So... Bit of pressure there on Asafast Berglund to score some points tonight. Um, and not in currently in our top five teams. I'll look to see how far down they are when we see things roll down a little bit. But a bit of pressure on her. Certainly, Matt, I don't know whether, I, I can't believe that, well, maybe, the, maybe they're, they're, well, they're probably seeing the data in front of you. But once you know you're the only rider from your team still left in that front group, you've got to calm yourself down from that, haven't you? And make sure you deliver. An awful lot of pressure in that position, isn't there? Exactly. I mean, if you are the last rider and you've got an elite group of riders, it's, it's like, well, OK, I'm going to score some points. You've got to try and maximise that opportunity. But also what it does, uh, it's easy to get a, a little bit carried away. So you've got to try and just try and just recuperate, sit in and use the other teams. There's no point as one individual rider of trying to do too much, trying to show your hand. And the riders will be acutely aware of that. But sometimes 
when you're on the edge, when the adrenaline's pump, pump, uh, pumping, it's hard to think rationally. It's very easy for us to kind of deconstruct and forensically analyze the tactics here because we're sat with our heart rates at about 70 beats a minute. When you look at 150, thinking, critical thinking is, is massively impaired. That's why you need a good direct sportif. And that's part of the skill set of being an elite athlete. Um, riding hard and making decisions is something you need to get good at. It's something you learn, uh, some, something some riders have more naturally. But yeah, if you're there, if you're one rider, the only representative one of one team here, it's about staying as calm as you can and maximizing the opportunity to get a good result. Because Team Swedish Swift is back in the day, that, that, as we said, they're an OG team. They're not quite the team that they were because a lot of their best riders have moved on to some of the bigger teams. They've been poached because, but they are, they, have, they, they had one of the best teams around for many, many years, but some of those riders have now moved on. But currently they do sit in sixth place uh, on the GC yeah. with 62 points. <clears throat> Well, it's as if Fast Bergland is listening to us, Matt, because we said she's the only one of their team in there. She's listening to you talking about their OG status, and she's just cruising off the front a little bit. Now coming back into the fold as well. By the way, I, I'm really enjoying seeing these in-screen shots of the riders. There's such a, a, a kind of diversity of, of faces and body type, the, 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 the body language, I mean, you know, that you're seeing from them. We just enjoyed watching... Um, Toyota Elite there. One of their riders, Joni Retzma, the Dutch woman, um, knocking out consistent 400 watts throughout, but sitting upright with her phone in her hand, texting as well. Now, whether yeah, she's she communicating with the rest of her... <laughs> Yeah, I'd imagine she'll she'll either be. Uh, I think generally r r uh, teams will use uh, Discord or WhatsApp. But actually, it's bringing Nathan yeah. here because uh, uh, I know that there are various platforms that, that teams use. But as we've got a little bit of a lull in the action um, before we kick off again on Box Hill, Nathan, is it Discord that teams um, I mean use? I know it's a, it's a great platform because the latency is really low. It's it's like they're there in the room with you. Is that common amongst most teams? Is that the way they will all be communicating? Do you think? Yeah, I mean, almost every single team that I've interacted with has gone to Discord. Uh, a little bit of Zwift history. Very early on, uh, there were a few other. Uh, we were using uh, TeamSpeak, I believe it was, super early on. When I actually, I actually made, I think, the original TeamSpeak server, uh, wow. and then Discord kind of took over, the, it, which is another gaming, you know, space before Discord really took off. And then, uh, and then Discord really took off as the main server for all of that. I have jumped into one or two um, team time trials or, or teams that maybe will make like a WhatsApp call or a group call on another platform. But Discord's really the main one a lot of people have used at this point because it does have enough features where you can create a, it, your own little social media space too, a, a, a space where there's more going on than just chatting in a race situation because you can go in afterwards and your your race can and your community can kind of live on and have a platform to interact on in a more private area rather than like facebook or something like that that's interesting i, I that's a useful insight nathan actually and it's no surprise to hear that you've been involved in furthering some of the use of those uh, those platforms as well I'm, i must admit i'll give a little shout out to to microsoft teams <laughs> of all things during uh the first covid lockdown i was involved with sort of team managing uh, a, a small team on uh, on zwift and we use microsoft teams and i must admit if you just use it as a voice call and avoid video altogether it's quite good actually it was pretty stable don't remember having any problems with it so um i guess the use of discord fits in with this being a game as well, a video game, the gamified nature of it kind of works quite nicely, I guess, with that platform too. Yeah, and I would I would jump in there like the it's the repeated use I think from a community over and over again because the channels live on within the app, and so you create a channel and then there's access to the channel and people can easily come back to find that space, and it also they also live on with a chat you know, in some sort of way, whereas like a Zoom call or Microsoft Teams or something like that, like if you're just going to meet up once, that might make a lot of sense rather than creating a space that might live on in existence, right? So that makes a lot more sense if it's just a single one-time interaction. Yeah, I, I think it's a fair shout, actually. I, I did a ride the other day um, <clears throat> and we used Discord. We had a, like a Q&A session using Discord. And, and again, Discord is used for all the reasons that Nathan said it lives on. They've got quite a lot of features. It is a separate standalone platform, but the 
the, the kind of voice network it has, the latency is so, so good because it's primarily used in gaming. So if you're in, in, a, in, a, in a co-op game, you know, there's no lag at all. So I think that's what's great in terms of racing. When, it's, when things are happening dynamically, it gives you the speed and that there's no drop off at all. So it's, uh, it's pretty cool without getting too geeky as we head on to the climb for the third time. Yep, the third time of four. So the penultimate ascent of the whole evening, in actual fact. In fact, of the whole Zwift Grand Prix, the penultimate ascent of Box Hill, that iconic London 2012 Olympic climb IRL, but also, as Matt's mentioned, such an important um, real-world climb in the world of Zwift here on the PRL Half London course. You are watching the women's... Epic points race, currently leading Coalition Alpha, our leading team, who've bossed this through Lou Bates. I'm going to throw this down now, uh, Nathan, for you to hear, while Matt's just taking a little break, I think I'm going to say it to everyone who's listening, I reckon Lou Bates is going to win both of these ascents of Box Hill and the final sprint. I think she's looked that good, Nathan. I'm not, I'm not, it's not exactly, it's quite feasible, but I'm just going to say it now because I know I think it's going to happen. That's what I reckon is going to happen. It's a tough one. You know, <laughs> I could see it happening. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't put it past her one bit. But with these kinds of punches over the, you know, duration we're seeing here, we've seen her time and again be able to perform at that kind of a level. At the same time, I'm watching some of these other riders that could hang on and might be better in a sprint at the end if they don't use up those matches. I'm, I, you know, it, it's a high probability I wouldn't go past an Ariel Varharin, though, if she can hang on mm. to the end. I wouldn't go past a Zoe Langham as well. We haven't seen her as much early season. And now with Zoe uh, back involved here and maybe waiting till the back end. And we saw this. Look, watch. Next eSports just won in the men's, right? Early on, we saw a lot of points going to Avis, going to Avis. But Avis ended up 13th, 14th, and 15th, I think it was, or something like that. And next ended up stacking a bunch at the top end and, and, and coming in with enough riders um, with enough points to end up taking it down in the end. I have a feeling there might be a couple of the teams out here thinking more in those terms rather than up front. I mean, I think Lou has to really do, and, and Mary have to do a lot to carry uh, the teams out there today, whereas we may see something more from Aeonian or even Wahoo Lacole uh, with consistency throughout the entirety of the race like we saw with Next in the men's race. Thank you, Nathan. Well, we've seen an attack, or a little bit of a teasing attack from Lucy Harris, the British rider at Toyota Elite. But now, once again, it's that Italian rider from Castelli, Celine Colombi, who's done a big dig. She's closed down by Harris, actually, who's obviously got good form, the Toyota rider. And we're seeing some gaps opening up further down that group as well. Yeah. I think we're going to see, once again, a bit of a grinder taken to the back end of that this time round. I think yeah, th this climb, it's a long climb. It's, it, it, for the, the women, I think that there'll be a kind of seven minute effort, seven and a half minute effort. It's a it's a long old climb. We know it's not super steep, but it is sustained enough. If you want to really press on on the front to make riders suffer, this is a real key, key part. I mean, without s stating uh, the obvious. So clearly, Colombi is a very good climber. Look at, and she's clearly in good form. Look at that, it's 5.8. She was just touching six watts a kilo. That's a really um, a good, good tempo. Um, you just saw the draft cone there. There's anybody outside of that draft cone is going to be at a distinct disadvantage. But as we were talking about before, this is a relatively fast climb, but it is a climb you can put people under pressure in. And if you're in a team with good climbers, you want to you want to utilize them and try and whittle down, take some of the bigger, more powerful riders out, or at the very least make them suffer. It's not just about dropping riders. It's about diminishing their ability to have that kick at the end and just making them suffer for as long as you can. It's about playing to your strengths on a course like this. If you haven't got a big punch, you haven't got a sprint, what do you have? You have the ability to make the other riders suffer and hopefully the elastic will snap a little bit later on. And that's what we're seeing Colombia doing again here as she's just moved off the front again. She just keeps lifting it, doesn't she? I'm also keeping my eyes on the Hexagon riders as well. Sandrine Etienne just moved forward right close to the front as well. She has a teammate there with her as well. There's two of them in this leading group. Let's see, you keep an eye on them. But Colombi is obviously very strong. Uh, Matt, I'm just wondering whether this is this is the best tactic. She keeps surging like this, but we've still got her quite a long way to go as well. And there we have it. Coalition Alpha is sitting in behind her as well, waiting. Just so, yeah, I mean, you've got yeah Lucy Harris up there, Mary Wilkinson, never too far from the front as well. Lou Bates, well, she is 
So, yeah. Uh, she's looming, isn't she? Sat there in seventh yep. place yep. at the moment in a very, very good position. And again, I think we, as we've seen, unsurprisingly, I think we see some of our power ups getting dropped very shortly. We've got around 500 meters, 600 meters Here to the go. top as Bates Here we go. appears yep. to wind things up. Matt, I mentioned it. You just took a little nature break there, and I don't blame you in a long broadcast. I mentioned to Nathan, I think, and I'm going to say it again now, I think Lou Bates is going to win every single sprint in this race. She's going for this one. I'm not sticking my neck out too much because she's looked so good so far. Is she going to get the third one in a row? It's looking like she is. Look at that. There is no answer. And once again, it's Mary Wilkinson, her own teammate, who's sitting in behind. Are we going to see these two Coalition Alpha riders take one and two again? And I think... The answer is no. Colombi's come back again. Where is the Italian getting that strength from? Lou Bates looks like she's going to hold on. She's won every sprint so far. There is only one more ascent here. That was a tight pack. For second behind them, Mika Soderstrom, the Swedish rider for Movistar. I said she's their only rider anywhere within a shout of scoring points today. And she's got a big bag there in second place ahead of... Uh, Simench of uh, Wahoo Lecol. Colombi with a great ride there in fourth place. I thought she'd burnt too many matches, but the Italian rider has obviously got very good form this evening too. It was Koistinen for uh, Toyota Esports as well, scoring points in fifth place. Yeah, that wow. was good. That was, that was, I really liked the word. I, I, yeah, the rider for me at the moment there was Colombi because she spent yeah. at least half of the climb off, off the front or just trying to drag them along and put them under pressure and then had enough to go again. So that's a, a real indicator of condition. One more ascent of this climb as we hit this little nasty, it's a real horrible kicker. If you get, if you hit this one exhausted, you're straight into the red and this is where the elastic can go. But as you can see by the shape of the group here, Harris now moving through to the front. Nobody right now is using this little kicker to exploit it's more let's just look around take stock um, and I think a few more riders might get back on a few more power-ups being deployed a little bit later rather than using them for the sprint using them to assist getting back on as we uh, change the picture in picture sorry uh, change our view should I say and it's a Harris of Wahoo Lacolle starting to drop down the other side now well, they need to get on with it because looking at the this picture we're looking at right now, I can't even see the next group behind them. These guys, these guys, these women surged really hard up through that line there as they chased Lou Bates, who's won every single sprint point so far, leading for the first three times over Boxer. As Matt has said, we've got one more ascent of it. They then go back north of the river. They go as if they're heading back towards the base of Box Hill, but they turn around and round about and they finish, in fact, along the Mall outside Buckingham Palace for that final sprint, which let me remind people, particularly if you didn't see the finish of the men's race, that carries the really big points. So Lou Bates has won three times 150 points. It's 150 points at the top of Box Hill every time. But our finish line has 300 points. And again, to remind our viewers at home, there are points for every finisher all the way down to five points for 80th, but only if you finish within the seven minutes of our leading rider. Yep. It's uh, just a bit of a, given how how dominant Lou Bates, and I, t I tell you what, I wouldn't want to bet against Lou Bates winning the next one. Whether she'll win the race itself, yep. that remains to be seen. <laughs> but the way she's climbing, she's unmatched. Nobody has even apparently attempted to go with her, and that's not taking anything away from anybody else. She has got such a ridiculously violent, strong turn of speed. But that accumulation of points, there's a chasmic gap now between... Uh, the two, mm. the first two teams at the top. But it's been a good night so far for Movistar. They're a team that normally would be well inside the top four or five overall. They're a little bit about halfway down the rankings of Movistar. I think they're in ninth place. Yep. But they're currently yep. second, so good night so far. But Coalition Alpha, get this, 525 points already wow. tonight. <laughs> um, Movistar with one, a distant 125. Toyota on the same. Then we have Ionian with 110. Yet yeah, Wahoo with 85 and then both tied on 40 next esports and yeah. team Castelli. Well, Matt, if I'm not mistaken, that 125 points for Movistar has, I think, entirely come from Mika Soderstrom as well. Yes, it has. She's looked yeah, good. Has, she yeah. really favours, seems to really suit the points races as well. Um, but that goes to show how many points you can rack up by one rider being that good in a leading group like this. I guess with the slightly smaller numbers compared to the men's leading group that we had coming towards the finish, with the smaller numbers here as well, it's a slightly, is it an easier tactical game? Because you know the numbers in this group, as long as they keep pressing on, not many more will join them, dare I say it, if any, because all the quality, all the best riders are here. 
There's a few names missing who are having not such a strong a night, but I don't see many getting back to this group. They're not hanging around, are they? Yeah, I think we might see, because the group has reduced and most of the runners you'd expect to be in the front are there, what, and we've got another ascent still to come, I think riders here might actually take it a little bit easy on this little bit of a kicker. And as we saw last time through, it's that little bit of an easing. It's a settling in, mm. still a long way to go, as you can see, 26.3 Ks, a full lap and a half, and that extra little bit of the end, uh, which takes us up them all. Um, I think we might see one or two riders getting back in, back in contention but still we might only see 25 riders in the front group and and to a degree you're right it does make tactics more simpler um but uh because you can see everybody and you'll have the ds there just giving that giving the information in your ear making sure you keep an eye on on certain riders so the tactics are simplified but in turn it adds a little bit more pressure on actually doing a performance so there's, there's, it's again it's double-edged Right, we're back north of the river in real life. The riders are riding around the edge of the city of London in the direction of Blackfriars, having crossed underneath Southwark Bridge, under there, and of course dropping quite a lot of their power-ups now because they're heading back towards the start line for the final time to pick up their... Oh, sorry, no, it's not the final time, of course, is it? it's the penultimate time to pick up the penultimate power-up from that position. They'll get another one, of course, let's not forget, at the top of Box Hill. One more ascent of Box Hill and then that, uh, well, quite tactical run-in. And the group this side is going to be a fascinating tactical run-in as well. We've, if anything, lost a few more riders there as well. Looking at the numbers, they're not, they're not absolutely hammering it, but I guess they don't need to now because they've consolidated this over the last, yeah. uh, what, 10k or so, Matt? Got, yeah, we've got 15 riders in that front group. It's only 15 riders in the front now, um, so that really, and there's a big gap, as you can see, it's 25 seconds back. Uh, when we scroll through to 15th, you can just see the gap, so it's about, yeah, 20, 15 or 25 seconds as we see the effervescent Colombi of Team Castelli. Yeah. She's not only going well on the, on the climbs, Jess, she's going well on the flat. I mean, should bring Nathan in just to give his assessment of what he thinks of this race so far. I think it's fascinating, but far more attritional than the men's, Nathan. From, ta from a tactical perspective, just I've given my view on what Jez's question was. What do you think? It, what, do you think it simplifies the tactics or, or do you think because there's less riders, everybody's keeping a closer eye on each other? What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, watching... So in-house here, I see one thing playing out that's all about just trying to hang on, hang on over and over again. Not really... You know, there's one tactic of like, finish line, get to the top 10. That's what we're thinking about. And then you've got a situation with Lou Bates and maybe somebody trying to challenge that's more about hanging on to the to any kind of effort till the very top to grab as many points up and over the top there. Um, you know, it is a little bit more straightforward, it does seem like, because it is just essentially wait until that moment at the top and see how far you can hang on and then watch riders slowly just fall off. One thing that's really interesting to me is the new pack dynamics definitely make it so you have to fight for a position on the road. Just a moment ago, I was, you know, kind of in Gabby's ear. And she's like, ah, I can't, whatever, da, da, da. And there was a misunderstanding about what exactly I was trying to get at it, uh, with her about not being stuck behind a rider. Um, because if a ri if you can kind of watch and see if a rider's holding the wheel, if they're letting a the gap go, and just like in real life, one of those like one, two, three, now you got five meters to close down, then they start accelerating at the front. Next thing you know, you're off the back and you're chasing. Whereas if you would have fought for position maybe a little earlier, if you fight for position and you find position earlier and you can hold it and, and not lose that position, you then can almost fade back slowly but grab onto the tail end of that sprint and hang on through so uh new pack dynamics definitely playing a huge role here and making sure you're in a good position because it matters going into the bottom of this climb and throughout the entirety of the climb nathan that's really interesting to hear you say that of course you've been there since the beginning so you've got to see how these changes have come in of course with the regular updates of the game itself and those changes to the pack dynamics it's got to be a good thing, though, isn't it? Although, as you say, it can make someone, you know, Gabby might panic about it. And it might, as you get used to it, you sort of think, hang on, why is this happening? It is at least making riders think really carefully. You can't just cruise along and expect your, your uh, on-screen rider to be exactly where you think they'll be. You've got to really concentrate on the feathering, as Matt calls it, of the power and where you are in that pack. Yeah, and it is a... Uh 
moment to moment decisions, split second decisions in the moment when moves are being made as to whether or not you'll sense or know that that rider that you're drafting on is going to be able to make that move. And, you know, there's experience with the riders and knowing them. And then there's also kind of just recognizing what's happening with the pixels on screen and like, ah, this looks like danger. And even if they are going to close it down, they might end up wasting both of your efforts a little bit more than they needed to be. So, you know, it's changed a lot in the last six months. That's for sure. It's worth pointing out, by the way, as we look at the pictures, we can see Gabby, your wife, in the middle of those shots at the bottom of the Saris Nopins riders. It's well worth remembering that these riders, these 80 riders, are all racing in countries all over the world. Nathan, can you just remind our viewers where you and Gabby are and what time of the day is it there? Yeah, sure. We're in uh, southeastern Wisconsin near Chicago slash Milwaukee. So Milwaukee would be the largest city uh, near to us. We're about an hour and a half away from Chicago. There's currently a snowstorm outside, so I'm wondering how my internet is going actually at this point. Like, we, I think, got a foot of snow in the last 48 hours. Wow. Uh, but uh, now Gabriela does have a Brazilian flag originally from Brazil. Uh, I met Gabrielle actually when she was living in Germany, and now she lives in the Midwest of Wisconsin. So <laughs> definitely uh, worldwide when it comes to uh, Zwifting, it, it definitely connects the entire world. Well, fantastic. Absolutely brilliant. Well, wherever you're watching this around the world on our Zwift YouTube channel, thank you for joining us, everyone. I hope the weather is not too bad where you are. I certainly can say I'm, I'm speaking to you from... Hertfordshire in England, and it's been really frozen today, bitterly cold. I'm guessing it's the same where you are, Matt, as well, as we watch our group reforming and calming down once more. Indeed. Well, I was actually, believe it or not, in New York today. Although I live in Derby, I was on Swift in New York. So I was in New York today <laughs> on Swift. But yeah, I'm in Derby in, in the north of England, or North Midlands, and it's pretty chilly. But uh, just as yeah. Nathan was talking a minute ago, we just saw that group swell. So we... Riders were at about three watts a kilo, three and a half watts a kilo at the front of the group, uh, the front of the main pack. And that definitely opened the door for riders to get back on. So the group has swelled to about 25, 30 riders now. And uh, we've got uh, Mouge, who's attacked again. She did this last lap and is persistent in her efforts to try and break clear. So a good move here by the Exagon rider straight over the top. Once we saw that regroupment, the group has swelled and she's seen the opportunity or decided to try and go clear along the banks of the River Thames in the shadow almost of the London Eye. Absolutely lovely. Actually, I tell you what, it looks like lovely weather in London in this uh, in the game, in Zwift itself as well. And it's always lovely weather as well, which is nice to see. Well, not always, but it is definitely in this version of London. Morge, don't forget having Sandrine Etienne sitting in behind. Just before we started talking weather, Etienne herself gave a little dig off the front, and I wasn't quite... We've not really seen her open up on the climb just yet, so she's not looking quite as strong as she was, of course, when we had that points race on the Alpe du Zwift. But let's see, is she one of those riders who might be holding something back? She's in that leading group, and there they go. Uh, very little chance of many more riders adding to that now. We need to look down through our listings and see off the back of them what's the gap to the next group. But I think it's pretty big as well. Yeah, well, they closed a gap of 15 seconds since the subway. Yeah, uh, but uh, but it's a fair it's a fair bit, and there's riders who are, who are way down now. So, but I, I have a feeling that we won't see any more riders get back on top. This that little section here, we can really lean on it. Uh, Morge still got a slender lead of just under a second on the front. Uh, Etienne uh, clearly won't do anything, but Mary Wilkinson just using that little incline just to inject a little bit more pace into it. She's a rider that can do that over and over again. One of the most experienced Swift riders out there. Uh, she really, really is. And as you were saying before, a former British hill climb champion. Mm. And, and there's her teammate, Lou Bates, as well, who so far has dominated 100% record. Uh, who is going to win at this climate next time up? Um, unless something changes, I can't see anybody beating it, to be perfectly honest no. with you. No. no, that's what I've said. I'm going to st I've stuck my neck well out, Matt, and it's not, <laughs> no, it's not, it's not, it's, it's, it's entirely predictable, but I think looking at her, I don't think any, I think the only person that can beat her maybe is Mary Wilkinson, but let's see. Wilkinson, of course, but I think I may have mentioned this before, is also a sheep farmer. She is an, well, as we know, because she's an, an elite rider, she's an incredibly fit athlete, but a, a real, the kind of exponent of the all-round fitness of working hard on the farm, tra working hard, training hard, playing hard. She is uh, quite some athlete, all-round athlete as well. Yeah, she said. I was just looking back through some of the numbers there. I think the next group on the road is 
about 50 seconds behind. That's, I guess, way too much to close now as we get to head ever nearer, going over the bridge again and heading back in towards Surrey. So it is. We've got about 25, 30 rods in this group. But as you say, yeah, Mary Wilkinson, um, her days are full, put it that way. And she gets out when she can. But as she said, lives up north. Uh, near the borders, I think, it's, I think it's Yorkshire, the neck of the woods yeah. she lives in, in, yeah. in the UK. But uh, but Mary Wilkinson, she'll certainly like this one. Uh, I'll no doubt that she'll be one of the riders who will applaud the distance of this race and hope that in future editions of the Zwift Grand Prix, we see more of this one. But again, it's not very often we see this. Uh, uh, Nathan was talking about seeing them in the Kiss 100. But I think every now and again, to see something like this is really good. And I really do like the way the Zwift, personally, like the way the Zwift Grand Prix has evolved. And I like the fact that week in, week out, we see something really different for the riders and the teams to tackle. Well, Nathan, just bring you on again a minute, mate, because you're you've been with the with Swift since since a year dot. You've helped form this 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 wonderful community. But what are your thoughts on the way of the evolution of the Swift Grand Prix and the various types of racing that the right the riders have got to train for and also think about? Yeah, it really allows every kind of talent that you could find within cycling to find their place, doesn't it, right? So today yeah. is a very different kind of race than we'd see in just a pure points hunter type race that we'll see next week. And so uh, you've got things where you've got situations where uh, pure ruler time trialists are going to excel. You've got situations where all out muckle yin sprint over and over again is going to play out. And then you've got situations like this where you have a much longer day uh, and endurance is really going to matter as well as a VO2 kick over and over and over again, much more like a road race might be. So I really, really enjoy that you're able to allow every kind of talent when you form a team across multiple kinds of roles that could be played, it allows that to be accentuated and really shown off at the highest level. Couldn't agree more. Guys, I can tell you, uh, just just fill you in. Thanks for that, Nathan. I'm just going to fill you in on a little bit of uh, a question that's been asked of our viewers on our YouTube channel, where you're watching at home. Do get involved in the, the questions on there and the chat at the, beneath the live feed that you're watching right now. The question that was posed to our viewers, will Lou Bates win the final intermediate and the finish line? In other words, do people agree with me? <laughs> and, and that's interesting, actually. 53% have said yes, but 46 say no. So yes, the majority of people do think she's going to win both, but um, there he is. And, and the, the, no, the naysayers in there are, are probably right to be thinking like that because the question has to be asked, who's been waiting? Who's sitting waiting, keeping their powder dry? Are we going to see any others of those Coalition Alpha riders uh, absolutely smash it? I mean, Morgé is looking very good as she heads she's back towards Box Hill right now, isn't she, Matt? Yeah, we've, uh, I'm not saying we've forgotten about it, but we're talking about other things, and she has yeah. built up uh, the biggest lead we've seen in this race. This is approaching the leads we saw um, by a couple of riders in the men's race uh, an hour ago or so, um, deep into the last third of the race, now 18 Ks to go, but to 21 seconds, and she's holding steady, isn't she? Four, four and a half watts a kilo. I'd imagine she'd be able to give a little bit more. Very important when you're pacing a ride like this, when you approach a climb, just to make sure... You'd almost the words I, li I like to call it is let the climb come to you rather than going full tilt into the climb after being away in the flat. Let the climb come to you. Find a biting point in the simplest of terms and then ride. And she's riding exceptionally well now. She's measured her effort uh, really, really decently here as we hit the lower slope. But wow. as we know before, 21 seconds is um, is a gap that can evaporate very quickly once the hitters start to get to the front if they're minded to. That is interesting, Matt. I hadn't spotted that. That Exagon, despite the fact they've got Etienne and Morgé in here, they haven't scored any race points yet. They sit in third in the overall classification, but no points yet tonight. So despite the fact that they're being very evident, we're seeing a lot of Morgé, so far it's not been a good night. And they need to make that count because they've got two really quality riders in this leading group who need to start getting in amongst the points. Yeah, they certainly do. Um, and the gap is coming down now. It's 14 seconds. So we said the lead could capitulate. Colombi, who uh, did a lot Again. of the damage earlier on. Uh, she's clearly feeling good. Well, she'll look back and she'll know the damage that she's caused. So why not do it again? Because if you know yep. you can't sprint, but what you can do is reduce the amount of rods you've got to sprint against. Why not do some damage on the climb and reduce it to 10 
12 riders and then score as much as you can that way. So it's not necessarily about trying to break clear. It's forcing riders to chase and reducing the size of the group in the process. So this you might think is a waste of energy, but when we look at the top and we see how many riders are left, it might actually be a pretty good play. Columbia, she's riding this, I think, possibly, as I watch it, from a coaching perspective, a little bit more cleverly than she has done the last. The last lap, she was riding it in surges. This looks a lot more steady. She's just hanging around that five watts per kilo mark. And in doing so, she is closing in on our leader, Morget, the French woman for Exegon. These are the second and third place teams in the overall classification. And, oh, sorry, I do apologise. Colombia, of course, is riding for Team Castelli, who are in 15th place. One off the bottom. So she really has been the uh, the standout player, not just for her team, but overall in the race tonight as well. Really impressive. Uh, but she's got company. And wouldn't you know it, yeah. Mary Wilkinson, right there. Yeah, look at that. They, they, they know she's dangerous. But uh, in the process, but just to draw the sting, I mean, to... To force riders like Lou Bates and Mary Wilkinson to bring you back, that shows that she's been offered a lot of respect and there will be riders who are in a little bit of difficulty. Um, and this sort of effort, where Moje, her best five-minute power um, uh, is, well, 5.33 5 watts a kilo. So this is what she's very good at. This is what she can do. And that great aerial shot on the, the National Trust hairpin showed the damage that she's actually caused there. Yeah, I love seeing the, uh, the drafting cone out behind the riders there as well. It's a really clear, clear indication of where you need to be riding in order to be getting the vast majority in that deep red colour right in the middle. Fascinating to watch that. It's something we don't see in our, in our commentary, Matt, in, uh, in real life racing, do we? We have to imagine it. It's wonderful to be able to see it in the game as it's, it is, is directly impacting these riders too. Exactly, um, that's what... Right, now, nah, do you know that's a useful one? 525 points we know, Coalition Alpha, bottom left of your screen. They are our leading team. They've got Mary Wilkinson right at the front. Lou Bates tucked in behind her, having won every point so far. Columbia comes back to the front again, by the way. She can't help herself, can she? The Italian rider, she is having a really good night here as well. Going in one more surge. The question is, is she teeing up a final Lou Bates kick? Watch the numbers, bottom left. Lou Bates sitting on 5.2 watts per kilo, 5.5. Let's see if she starts to lift it, because this was a roundabout here where she started to move through last time. Bates, yeah. look at that. You've got three British riders in the top five as well, but still sitting on this super strong Italian. Well, she knows what she's doing this rather than like what she clearly hasn't got. Um, she's playing to her strength. She hasn't got that short, real top end. But what she has is the ability to ride very hard for a sustained amount of time. Harris gets across the gap. Bates knows there's danger. She's looking at this 100% record, but, but Colombi still clearly is riding to her strengths. And the, the watch she's kicking out at the moment are sustainable. She can actually go a little bit quicker for a set period of time. But bear in mind, you know, we've already ridden 50 odd Ks in this race. We're kind of 60 or a little bit more, 52 Ks. It's a long, long race. But Colombi is causing some damage. Soderstrom is there. Harris is there. Wilkinson. And it's just a matter of time now before Bates tries to go again. But Columbia is putting yeah. this real classy elite group of riders. The cream has really risen to the top here. Zoe Langham as well moving yeah. up as well. But Bates looks like the one that's going to pounce very shortly as we soon will round that right-hander and it opens out towards the finish at the top of the climb. There's a long tree line straight that takes you up to that fantastic cafe at the top of Box Hill. I've had a lovely cream scone there, I seem to remember. It's probably about 20 years ago now, Matt. So, But uh, it's a wonderful spot to stop and watch. These riders will not be doing that. And Colombia certainly won't because she just persists. Um, she deserves to get something out of this. I'll be a bit cheesed off if everyone rolls her come this sprint, but it could happen. One who certainly wants to roll her is Lou Bates, who looks like she is well twitchy, sitting on those 5.4 watts per kilo. Exactly the same uh, watts per kilo currently, the same effort being put out as Columbia, who is on a great ride, the Italian tonight. Those two distancing Harris and everyone else as well. You still sense that Bates is waiting, though, ready to go. Yep. Good to but see uh, Zoe Langham... Yeah, Harris, oh, Langham. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Yeah, no, Lou, Lou Bates should be opening things up in a minute. Just wait for that power up to drop. She's already moving clear. An indication of her winding it up. And there she goes. Uh, middle of the shot. You can see her coach there, a partner, uh, having a word with her as she absolutely flies. But uh, Lou Bates is looking good. Columbia still not too far away. But Lou Bates doing exactly what she did previously. She, at the moment, Jez, is absolutely untouchable. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, so close, though, to the finish line now. We'll see her around that corner. Having said that, it's closing up. Let's look at the gaps. Colombi is coming back again. Matt, we've got to see her get to the finish line first, though, because this is close. Closer than last Ooh, time, too, isn't it? She got it. <laughs> she got it. Oda strong. That was close. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Another brilliant ride by Colombi as well, the Italian. Riding there as the only representative of her team, right up there, representing Castelli in that leading group as well. She can be really proud of that, but... Uh, once again, Lou Bates has done it. And Mika Soderstrom, by the looks of it, actually, yes, she did get the second place there behind Bates. Zoe Langham looking stronger and stronger as this race goes on. So we'll watch out for her in the final sprint as well. Uh, riding for Wahoo Lacole. It was Columbia again got fourth place. More points again for Castelli. And that'll be really helping them tonight, I think. It was it, uh, it really will. It Lucy really Harris. will. I mean, Oh, totally. Well, Columbia scored. She's scored another 40 points. She's now on 80. Well, the team are, are on 80. But what we have is a big split. We've only got 14 riders in the front group. Um, and the last ride is actually 10 seconds behind our leaders. So the, our front group at the moment are spread over around 10 seconds. Columbia has gone solo and has a three or four second lead, carrying that effort, just showing that ability uh, to go uh, time after time, that real indication uh, of the form she's got. But importantly, she's caused a lot of damage on the climb and she isn't now hanging about. She's like, if anybody wants to no. go with me, they've got to make in an effort. So clearly she's playing again. I, I feel like I'm a, a stuck record here. She's playing to a straight. Let's bring in Nathan. We've, we've, uh, we need to bring in Nathan here. Nathan, 14 and a bit Ks to go. What about the riding of this Italian from uh, from the Castelli team? I think it's really impressive because she clearly is, to me, mate, playing to her strengths. It's extremely impressive. And obviously she's got the power to go steady, 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 steady. And, you know, I, I'm, you know I, I'm not sure she could take down a sprint against yeah. the rest of this crew and so this is exactly what she needs to do now the only thing is what i'd like to see her do right now is get that speed up pretty high and get into a super tuck and then get the speed yeah. up pretty high and get into a super tuck because behind here they're going to start super tucking at the front and they're currently doing about 63 plus kilometers per hour whereas columbia's only doing 60 so they're going to keep rolling through with some speed whereas columbia is trying to be a little bit too consistent on the downhill where she could do a little bit more gamification to keep the speeds a little bit higher Definitely a top tip there. Hopefully she's listening to you, Nathan, uh, to be a little bit biased because I do like an aggressive rider. Uh, Jez, this mm. is fascinating stuff, but we have a proper yep. selection. <clears throat> um, in fact, our lead group is spread over 14 <laughs> seconds, and then the next group is another 20 seconds behind. Ooh, there's not a massive gap then. Um, do you know what? Nathan was talking to us earlier, wasn't he, Matt, about what would be being shouted into those Team Castelli riders' ears. I absolutely dread to think what is being shouted into the ears of Colombia. It must be absolute screaming. By the way, have a look at Megan Rathwell there. It is obviously quite cool in her pain cave because she's got long sleeve on and the hood up as well. That's some severe cooling. I'm not sure where she is in the world, but it is chilly there. I think you can accept that. Yeah, she had looks like she had a hoodie on there, but uh, yeah, she well, has. She has. Uh, one one thing I, I normally give a shout out. You gave it a shout out in the previous in the men's race. Um, if you are watching this, we know we've got a, quite a few of you on YouTube. Obviously, clearly watching the live comms. Fire open your companion apps, guys, and give these uh, elite ladies a ride on, please, because that's what we need to see. Some more of those ride ons dropping into the back pockets, because uh, um, you know without the fans without the supporters here getting behind the community uh we, we don't we don't have the racing so uh, thank you for watching but please fire up the companion apps give these riders some ride-ons and hopefully we'll see um a different blizzard to the one that nathan is experiencing it's a blizzard of thumbs ups <laughs> as we head in towards the underground here yeah that is what we want to see if you're kind of also if you're new to watching uh, Zwift racing and you're enjoying watching this at the beginning of this calendar year even though we're getting towards the end of the Zwift Grand Prix next Thursday night is the final round don't forget we are homing in on the biggest ever Zwift event the Zwift Games right the way through the first three weekends of March actually though all of you who are racing on Zwift can compete in those Zwift games during the weeks leading up to those weekends the weekends are where we're going to show you the elite the professional racing here on our YouTube channel but you can actually take part in the same Zwift games during the week as well. Check it all out at Zwift.com. An opportunity to be involved in a massive esports event here on Zwift. It's going to be brilliant in March. And we're really excited about bringing it to you. We're doing some new things on the broadcast front 
It's going to be really top notch, but also the racing itself is going to be mega. There's a sprint championship, an epic championship and a climb championship, which of course finishes on the app to Zwift. And all of you at home, if you're on Zwift, as I'm sure you are, can get on it and get involved too, to see where you feature against some of the best pro riders in the world, including the vast majority, of course, of this lot. By the way, Matt, we've got some recent stats to tell us how many riders are still in play. Last time we checked, there were 65 of the 80 starters who are still within the seven minute cutoff. So there are still plenty of riders who are out of that as well. They'll, I guess, persist. You would, wouldn't you? Because they will anyway. But also you don't know what might happen to the riders in front, uh, who might uh, start to slow down, who you might catch. So you just rock on. It's one very hard night on the bike, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, just over 10 k's to go now. It's a keep on going, and then a minute and a half in 10 k's. Uh, well, yeah, they should be. They should be fine. That that group that's just behind there. It's all about scoring points. And this woman so far has scored 80. Sorry, for, yeah, 80 for Castelli. That certainly one would imagine will move them up the ranking. Celine uh, Colombi is enjoying another three seconds lead, four seconds on the group behind. But I was just looking at the numbers of the riders in this elite group at the front. And I think I'm going to stick my neck out, Jez and Nathan, and say that this is the group that's going to go to the finish. And it's only 14 riders strong. The 15th rider on the road is from Coalition Alpha, yep. 42 seconds behind our leader now. So the winner of the round is going to come from this group. And looking at the teams with the most riders out in front, it's going to be well, Wahoo have one, <laughs> Ionian just, uh, Ionian have two, Coalition Alpha. It looks like they have at least three or four. So it's advantage, yep. Coalition Alpha, and they're already going into the, the this final sprint finish with a whopping 675 points. So it's looking like it's their, well, it's their, their night to lose. I think it might be impossible for them to lose this one now. Yeah. We're watching right now the Belgian rider, Eleanor Wiseman, who is closing in on our leader, Colombi, who's done such a good ride tonight. She is about to get company, though, by the looks of it, and it's one of the two Saris Nopins riders who's in the leading group, Eleanor Wiseman. We know Gabby Guerrero is also in that leading group, too. So a good night for the Saris team, who are in eighth. And there goes Colombi going through our start line. She rolls on, going westward over in the direction of Buckingham Palace. They'll go right past the turn that they would take to the finish. They're going to the base of Box Hill. They go round the little roundabout and back on themselves. It sounds like an awfully long way. That 9.6k will rock through very quickly, actually, particularly with the racing we've got going on in front of us. Nice to see plenty of ride-ons being dropped for Columbia. She has done a brilliant ride already tonight. What is yet to come? Because she's shown quite superb resilience and ability to keep going again and again and again so this might not be the end of her if she's caught here two well, coming together at the, at the front end yeah sorry just look at the picture and picture we've got Celine Colombi our leader but look at the effort of Eleanor Wiseman you know just trying to get in contact and as soon as she gets into the draft of Colombi it'll make things so much easier for her uh, but it's hard to cross the gap. She's still not quite on. It's about 0.7 <laughs> of a second. And you're really feeling for her. And uh, Nathan, just explain to us, um, for those people who are watching, who haven't raced on Zwift, how, how hard it is actually when you're on your own to get into that draft cone. Yeah, really, you, you know, it's you second guess whether or not you're there a lot too. Like it feels like I should be maybe, I don't know. Uh, and yeah, and yeah. then like you start getting a little bit of draft and you're like, you want to completely back off. You want to rest, right? You want to be like, okay, yeah. I've made it. And then it's, and then sometimes you end up having to do two or three more efforts. And I've actually tried going across before almost made it and just didn't put that little bit extra <laughs> in, which then ended up, then I just didn't make it. I mean, it's really sometimes just a few meters, but she's on now. And as you can see, look at how much of a difference. Columbia doing 4.6, 4.5, I think it is. Weissman all the way down to 2.5 at times. Huge energy reserves. What I want to know is how long Columbia's going to allow her to sit there, though, mm -hmm. before she says, no, sorry, your rest is over. You got to start working. I know it was hard to get here, but you asked for it. Yeah, but look at what yeah. look at the difference it's made. If they start relaying together, once Weisman has that little bit of rest, and you'd, you'd imagine that the Belgian for the Saris No Pins team will start riding. But as since this conversation's gone on, the two out in front have opened up a lead of 18 seconds now, Jez, with 8.1 k's to go. It's about five miles to go. We've still got that horrible little section to go through the underground and up the steep, brutal escalators. But it's heading towards a 20-second lead now. Yeah. 
And now, this could be what I was hinting at possibly happening in the men's race, Matt, where we see two riders from teams who aren't a threat to the overall at the moment getting clear, and then our leading teams of uh, Coalition Alpha, Aeonia and Hexagon looking at each other and going, well, we don't need to chase this. Although Wilkinson is on the front, they're not exactly firing away to chase these. Look at the watts per kilo. Much higher in our leading two riders. And uh, as we know, Saris Nopins and Team Castelli, Team Castelli sitting second from the bottom in the classification going into this, they're not a threat now. We're getting to the very pointy end of this Swift Grand Prix. They, those leading three ride teams, sorry, all want to be the winning team at the end of next week's Points Hunter. That's what we're seeing, isn't it? It, it, it is a, a wonderful yeah. opportunity for those two riders. Well, that's the thing. You know, we've had, we had a 14 rider front group. Um, Colombi left that group. Harris is now trying to get across the gap. She's at 25 seconds, 7.3 Ks to go. This is, you know, this is possible for Colombia and Weizmann to, to, to do something, Weizmann, should I say, do something pretty special here. But there's only 12 riders behind. Everybody's going to be looking to Coalition Alpha to shut this gap down. Um, and I think that's opening the door to Colombia and Weizmann to pull off something, a bit of a coup here, something you wouldn't expect. But um, you, you've got to doff your cap. Whatever happens now, uh, the woman of the yeah. match for me has been Selena Colombi of Team Cascade. She has really made this race. She's been brave. Totally, and it's not over, Matt, either yet. She seems to have the resilience to keep going again and again and again. Let's watch. Well, when we go back to her picture in picture, when we see her, the thing that isn't hanging on, though, is her towel. She's had that towel around her neck from the beginning, and it's gradually dropping to one. It's just about a drop off. It's entirely trivial, I know, but I can't help but noticing it every time we go back to her. Hello, Lou Bates has come to the front and he's doing a bigger turn here. But this, you look at the numbers, though, they're still not pushing on as much as our two leaders who are consistently knocking no. around that five watts per kilo mark. It's twos and yeah. threes behind them. Yeah, totally. They might survive I mean, to the finish. Yeah, if this continues on, if they get to under five Ks to go with a 25 second lead, I think we need to bring Nathan in again here. I think this is looking pretty good because we continue to see Colombo and Weisman swap in five, six watts a kilo and still behind. Um, there's a surge now by Wilkinson, 6.6 .6 watts a kilo, especially up this drag. Nathan, this is where they could lose up to 10 seconds just in this few hundred meters. Yeah, they could lose a lot right here, but at the same time, you know, it's seven watts per kilogram versus five. We're not seeing orange numbers, so it will bring back probably about five seconds after all this said and done. It also a lot depends on how much Colombian and Weisman use the downhill they're about to experience. If they can carry a lot of like a lot of speed over this hump and then into the downhill, and then look and see what that group does. They've brought back, like you said, about five seconds. Now it calms down with laying them on the front there at two point five. It looks to me like there's so much infighting here. It's going to have to be more of a monster attack that goes, I think, that really starts to bring things back together and not as much of a working together. You know, we have a very different situation than the men's situation where we had it down to about 10 seconds at this point. That extra 12 seconds and still going out, not coming back. This is going to be very touch and go. Much more of a 50-50 situation I'm thinking here right now. I do good. Just a quick one for me as well, and Nathan. How's Gabby? She's still hanging tough in that front group. Could be a really solid top ten for her today, man. Yeah, you know, you know, early on, I think she was a little surprised by her inability to kick. Right now, she is has been a little bit under, just a little bit, not full on symptoms or anything. But I think as the race has gone on, because of that endurance and her ability just to have uh, the uh, a rider who can handle a lot of attrition, I think that it does favor her perhaps for a top five or even you know come in for a sprint. Uh, I've been DSing here and telling her, hey, watch what you're doing <laughs> there. Oh, I don't know. I got come. I don't know what doing that. Wait, hold on a second. You know, she almost actually started chasing Weissman for a moment say hey, that's your teammate go last second and now yeah. things are okay so <laughs> Nathan dare I say it this is a good night for you you're the linchpin in here you see it's your own team team Castelli your own racing team and then your wife's team as well what's going on here you got your well who do I root for football. now I mean who do I root for now is the big question <laughs> exactly. right so it's a win-win yeah. it's a win-win and even win if uh if Gabby can get a good group sprint but we'll see how it goes yeah. I mean watch out for Bates and uh it might be the Bates Harris move still tonight what Josh did was pretty amazing and I wouldn't be surprised one bit if Lou tried pulling something similar 
Well, let's see. Let me update people just in case they've joined us just late on in this women's race. What you're watching is the penultimate race in the Zwift Grand Prix. This is the women's epic points race. Coalition Alpha, who have bossed the series really so far in this Zwift Grand Prix, have started 2024 and here they are on 675 points because Lou Bates, the British rider for Coalition Alpha, has won every single sprint so far. Movistar are sitting second. Big thanks to Mika Soderstrom, their consistent, fast finishing uh, Mobby Star Rider in the dark blue in that group. They sit second and Toyota Elite E-Cycling way down in third, but way down in terms of numbers on 160 points. Coalition Alpha have more than bossed this. They have crushed it. But we are seeing a brilliant ride by this Italian rider, Sandra Colombi, uh, sorry, Selene Colombi, who is in this leading group in the company of Wiseman. Uh, who has joined her as well. Two of the slightly lower ranked team, although it's worth pointing out that Saris started this evening in eighth place, but they're not quite threatening the likes of Aeonian and Coalition Alpha. And that is, in a small part, why these two have been allowed to go clear, but it has to be said, a lot of it has been under that really strong riding by Columbia because we're consistently seeing their power much higher. And again, even now, Matt, with uh, just under 4K to go now, this chasing group is going nowhere near as hard as our leaders. Yeah, they've just started to pick it up. The lead over the bridge actually maxed out at about 31 and a half seconds, roughly. It's now come down to 25 seconds, so it is on the decline. Uh, but Wiseman and Columbia are still relaying very well together. Wiseman right in the red now. Look at our heart rate, 181. Yeah. Only two beats less for Columbia. They have ridden so aggressive today. They've got a lead of 24.5 seconds. I think it might be just enough for them to hold on. They've still got to go through and back out uh, across the bridge and into town before finishing on the mall, of course. But it's looking good. 24 seconds to the group behind, containing only 12 riders. And there's a big attack now. It looks like Harris has now tried to clip off the front. Yeah, they're heading on their way back. This uh, this is the roundabout, I think, isn't it? Is this the roundabout where they turn around? I'm trying it to remember indeed, where exactly yeah. where we are on the course. Yes, yeah, so they're on their way back, back to the river, back in towards London. And uh, Lucy Harris has had a good night tonight for Toyota to Elite. Let's not forget they started the day in uh, seventh place. But really down to Lucy Harris, they are sitting third place on the night at the moment. Make a soda strom now, making a little roll over the top of her as well. The, the, the single rider from Movistar who's kept them in second place on the night right now, soda strom. And she's not just relying on her sprinting either by the looks of it, Matt. She wants to push on, see if she can get some separation. Indeed. Well, these two have just uh, just clipped clipped off a little bit. They're just in, they're enjoying uh, just a second and a half in front as we come towards this uh, this real hard little kicker. Remember, it maxes out at about 13 percent. They've been brought back by the might of Lou Bates, one of the most dominant riders here. But although it looks like they're going to take the night because they've got three riders in this front group or the second group on the road and a massive tally of six seven five. Uh, the win on the night, although the gap is coming down, it's still going to be hard to call. 21 seconds. So another three seconds have gone off the lead with two and a half k's to go. This all-important climb, which the group behind are just on now. Matt, this is really important. Let's spot a couple of things here to point out. Hexagon started the day in third place. They have not scored... As far as I can tell, I don't think they've scored any points at all, despite the tonight, fact they have no, two no. riders in this leading group in the orange. That is a bad night for them. We can see them moving down. We can see Wahoo Lacole definitely moving up. They're in fourth place right now. But Aonia, our defending champions, who came into the night in second place, are currently sitting in fifth. They need a big final sprint. Let's not forget, 300 points on the line. So these riders, all of these, what, 14 riders in this leading group, even the last of them will score 155 points on the night. But as we see Motas moving through, Exegon need to get some high points in there if they're to maintain their podium position going into the final round. Yep, it's a, a, there is a lot to play for, isn't there? Of course there is. Um, still a lot of pot potential moving around. It's a little bit closer at the top than it is in the men's league, a little bit tighter, so therefore an opportunity for some teams to leapfrog others or even slip down. But with 1,900 metres to go, the gap has gone out. It does look as if the victory, the individual victory tonight, is going to go to either Celine Colombi of Italy riding for Team Castelli or the Belgian rider Weisman of Saris Nopins because they've got 27 seconds. It looks like the pace and the shape of this group behind, they've settled for third place on the day. 
Yeah, it does look that way, Matt, doesn't it? So we're going to see a fascinating sprint now. 29, yeah, so let's call it 30 seconds back to the group that's led by Lou Bates right now with all those leading teams in it. Columbia and Wiseman have snuck away and made this work brilliantly between the two of them. Not sort of a sneaky move. They've had to lay down some megawatts to stay clear and they've made it count too as well. So I think imminently we'll start focusing on the two riders in the lead. This is the third group on the road, if I'm not mistaken, who are one minute down as well. So we're getting a little look a bit further down the field. That's useful too. Gotchka Paul, the German rider for Coalition Alpha. She's the next of our counters in that next group. But in fact, they've got two riders in that group behind as well. Unless we've got I'm missing three, something, Matt. She made her way back up. The... No, this. Yeah. Yeah, yes, no, there's, there's two right. coalition alpha in the front and three in the third group on the road. We've only got uh, 1.1 k's to go. We need to head back to the front, I think, now to see who's going to take this one. Right, there's been a, a little, uh, by the looks of it, there's been another question on our YouTube channel. Who do you think will win? 45% uh, of people chose Wiseman, 30% Colo chose Columbia, and 23% thought the chase group would win. Let's see, though, because we're into the last 800 metres. Lucy Harris is trying to get across. Oh, now it's calmed down a little bit between Columbia and Wiseman. Wiseman having taken the lead now. The uh, Belgian rider for Saris, no pins. They can't mess around too much, though, because things are definitely hottening up behind, looking at the numbers. But then again, Colombi, if we go back to the front at the moment, it looks like she's laying down some big watts, six watts per kilo. What's going to happen between these two? They can see the finish line already. Wow, I think Colombi's going to do it, Matt, by then. She would really deserve this. What's Wiseman got left? Oh. Colombi just holding that little gap. It must be killing them right now. Oh. Look at the distance. <laughs> Look at that and the effort between the two riders at the bottom of the shot. The towel is still there for Columbia. Can she hang on? Weisman nope. coming past her, though. Columbia's done a lot of work, Matt. No, it is. But There's the finish line. Through. Wow. Wow. Look at that. Eleanor Weisman through the finish line in the lead. <laughs> oh, that was close. <laughs> wow. Well, oh, uh, wow. Wow. Mary Wilkinson was right there. Wow, that is incredible, isn't it? So um, things really did close up come the finish as well. We can just see in shot uh, in our little screen. Now, the viewers can't see it, but Nathan is screaming instructions at Gabby, his wife, as she comes across the line too. And that is uh, the vast majority of our leading group. I think all of our leading group in now as well. It looks like Gabby's finished inside the top 10 as well. So a good finishing sprint for her. This is the next group coming in right now. Don't forget the clock is now going. Seven minutes is the, uh, the gap for the riders who are going to count in those counting positions to score points in this penultimate round of the Zwift Grand Prix. The power-ups, the drafting power-ups are all being dropped right now as these riders make their way towards the finish line. This is the second group on the road. Uh, looks like I think Sandra Etienne has dropped to that group as well by the looks of it. That we didn't know, I didn't notice her going out of the back, but she's the next of the Hexagon riders in that group as well. They're coming across the line right now. Wow, what a finale, Matt Stevens. That was a bit was of a great. good round, that. A epic, literally epic, wasn't it? Yeah, it was great. And um, we, we, we talked, uh, I mean, Colombia, unfortunately, um, will have to be, I think she's still, she'll be disappointed, but or, upon reflection, she made the race. She made that selection. Um, I don't think there's going to be any doubt about the Coalition Alpha win on the night. They got fifth and sixth, Mary Wilkinson and Lou Bates, um, scoring a lot of points inside the top 10 to augment that um, the 675 points that they scored out on the road. So I think it's going to be a Coalition Alpha route. But what an important victory for the rider from Saris Nopins. They started um, today's round in eighth place uh, with only 50 points. Uh, but I think that individual win is, uh, well, fortune favours the brave. And both Colombian Wiseman uh, took a risk. Colombia was the rider that really forced the pace on the climb. And for me, she's the woman of the match. But Wiseman is the winner. But uh, great mm. riding. And something we potentially didn't expect, uh, two riders to go clear and take the individual win on the night. But um, yep. another strong, strong evening from a points perspective, from a team perspective, from Coalition Alpha. I think, I think what excites me, Matt, watching that, and I'm really exciting, I'm really excited for the, the kind of the ongoing Zwift Grand Prix over the coming seasons. Bear in mind, this is only the second edition of it. And there was Coalition Alpha last year coming 10th, watching Aoni and the head of them as they took the win learning from it obviously bolstering their roster as well with the right kind of riders not just good riders but the right kind of riders for the format of the Zwift Grand Prix and it has worked they absolutely crushed it this evening really crushed yep. it I mean 
in the end, uh, Mika Soderstrom's Movistar points have dropped down a little bit because she, I don't know where she was in that final sprint, actually, but uh, certainly in the end, her, she's moved down. The final sprint has really been important, um, and it's going to be fascinating to see the impact of that on the, the, the general classification going into the final round. And I love, I absolutely love the points, Hunter, Matt, because I hate to say it. The reason I love it so much is because there's so much opportunity for jeopardy. There's so much opportunity for things to go wrong. This, this tonight was, yes, as you said, a real endurance test. There was a, a strong tactical element to it, but also in, the, in a way, the, the strongest and the best riders boiled to the top and it was fascinating to see uh, Colombia and Wiseman really taking advantage of that in the end but but next week the final round there is there is quite a lot of opportunity to get things wrong in the points hunter isn't there and suddenly find yourself out of it having scored just you know one point or something oh definitely Very, uh, no, I, I couldn't agree more it set things up really nicely I think I've really enjoyed this Swift Grand Prix so far great race tonight so we've, let's bring in uh, Nathan again Nathan uh, Gabby, 10th in the end for Saris Nopins, but importantly, they've bookended the top 10. They've got the win on the night. I know they're not your team, but you're gonna, there's going to be a bit of a, some happiness there for you. But oh, your overview of the race, I thought it's a spectacular race tonight. Yeah, really good race. Uh, both the men's and the women's race, both of them had breakaway situations. The, race, the, the racers made the race, for sure. There wasn't, uh, you know... In, in in the local mountain biking crowd uh, at, at the elite level, we, we call it holding hands. We're not holding hands today. Nope, not holding <laughs> hands. And, uh, and, and, and I liked it that uh, there was aggression. You know, I saw also in chat, a, you know, a shout out to Team Castelli and, you know, being super aggressive on the day for sure. So that was really great to see. You know, I think Columbia getting, uh, you know, Cy Bradley's actually in chat letting know that he thinks she should get the combative award. Definitely, uh, maybe not win the day, but definitely made the race extremely interesting and really cool yeah. to see that the breakaway uh, was able to stick away, stay away on the day. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, I know it's unofficial that there's no, that we don't actually have a most aggressive rider, but I think collectively, Nathan, between me, you, and Jez, Jez, I hope you're on side, mate. I think uh, the woman of the match uh, is going to be uh, is going to be Celine Colombi. So a big thumbs up from us. Unofficial, of course, but uh, yeah, I think that's well deserved and a, a great race. As we've got uh, 43 riders home, five minutes has now passed. So. Um, and there's a group mm. at 6.23. So the next five or six rides are going to come home within that seven-minute time uh, cut. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll get the final scores totted up. But no doubt about the winners tonight, that's for sure. No, absolutely. And it's going to be an interesting one to watch this group come in. That group who are at 6.23, uh, not only have they got to stay under the seven-minute mark, but they're going to sprint out their finishing positions too because they're all scoring yeah. points and they'll all be adding to their team tally. So... It's a wonderful night where, look at this, we're watching this sprint happening. They're dropping their power-ups and they're going to be absolutely smashing it to try and score as highly as they can from the group they are in as well. Great racing, great format all the way down through the field as well. And that is quite some finishing straight as well, isn't it? I think it's almost the, it's the colour of the 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 mall or the mall, <laughs> whichever one you choose. And this is a bit of a mall rolling towards the line as well. It's uh, Gosh, it's a hard finishing straight that as well. It seems to go on for an eternity. It really, it really does. It's probably the longest, the, the longest 600 meters. Oh, there we go. There's the cutoff. It's 57 yep. riders have scored uh, tonight, Jez. There's the red on the right-hand side, just saying that anybody else, unfortunately, uh, will not yep. score tonight. Yeah, got to feel for Hannah Dannel, the uh, Swedish rider, because she's going to be the first of those who doesn't score, unfortunately, as well, despite the. The pedigree of the riders here so 80 started and only 57 are going to finish within that time gap that shows just how hard it was at the front and and you know it, it's always fascinating watching that sprint there in front of uh of buckingham palace as it is on this prl half course in london as well matt but now we're looking up the shots of the climb which has really forged it all box hill once again uh, a brilliant Swift climb, a brilliant IRL climb as well, but absolutely crucial to the, the racing we've seen happen this evening as well. Yeah, definitely. And in both the men's and women's races, there were selections made. We knew it was going to be a race of attrition, even more attritional in the women's race. But, uh, but it's good to see riders actually making the race, getting a result in terms of a result on the night. We know that the Swift Grand Prix is all about the team, 
But I tell you what, to have a top a podium spot in a Zwift Grand Prix as an individual, regardless of the team, is something massively important for the, for these riders. It really, really is, especially for the likes of Wiseman and Colombi, who are riders that uh, have been around for a while, are respected, but haven't really ever had a result like this. And, you know, a result like this for any rider in any sport, in, in, in fact, could actually change the course of, of, of um, well, it's certainly going to give them a lot of morale and also maybe give them a yeah. new sense of belief about what they can do if they race aggressively. Um, and as Nathan was talking about earlier on, this particular round with its 69.7 Ks is another facet that I think will be a regular feature. I don't think we're using too often, but it's something that Roger's going to have to think about. Uh, and it does suit certain um, certain other types of riders. And they've come, to, they've come to the fore today, the riders with that real ability to take a lot of punishment, who race aggressively, but can also race at or near, at or around threshold for, for an hour and a half, you know, and that's how long this has taken tonight. It's been a big, big day in the office. Absolutely. Now, not just for the riders, but for us, it's been a long broadcast, this one, this evening. Yeah, I hope you've enjoyed yeah, it. Let's just... be... <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Nathan, can I check in with you one last time? It's been absolutely brilliant having you with us this evening, joining Matt and I here. First of all, uh, Nathan, how is Gabby next to you? Absolutely exhausted, I expect, after a long one like that, but is she happy with that? She seems pretty happy. She can join you on she mic. Said, she, she actually said, I mean. she said that was the minimum of her satis- satisfaction like that. Like I had to get a top 10 is what she was like. You know, she, uh, she came in and she was like, oh, I don't quite have what maybe she would used to wanting to have as far as the power goes tonight. And then, um, you know, up front, I, I saw her have a moment of decision of like how she was going to deal with her expectations of herself, you know? So, um, I encouraged her to let go of those expectations and to, um, not get down on herself. If the heart rate was higher than usual, the power wasn't there to go for sprints. And then, you know, she has a really high expectation of herself to be at the front and be in contention for all of those different situations. And when that wasn't happening, I saw a moment where she could shut off and go, Oh, it's just not a day and everything's bad. But instead of no, like there's a long race, there's a lot that can play out and hang on. Maybe things will come around in the end and ends up with a top 10 and, and, and actually assisting her teammate because you're not going to drag Gabby up, right? Like that's a, that's a thing that ended up yeah. in that situation there. Since she didn't chase her teammate, then Gabriella was able to sit in and people are thinking a little bit more whether or not they're going to do work and bring Gara up to her teammate. Nathan, please don't take this the wrong way. But in a week from now, I hope I'm not talking to you. Because I hope you're racing. <laughs> you know what I well, mean. Well, that. that's going to take a lot of intervals and a, and, and a slight miracle. Yeah. But hopefully, I hope you're right too. I hope you're right too. I appreciate it. <laughs> Listen, get well, mate. It's been great having you on with us again this evening. Give our best to Gabby. Uh, well done to both of you, and, uh, and and do get well, won't you? Thanks for being with us, Nathan. Cheers, Nathan. Um, Thank think, you. Cheers, everybody. I I think we can bring you up to speed with the finish line points. Uh, maybe teeing that up. Let's have a look at them. Right. So these are the finish line points for the riders across the line. As we said, 300 points for the first finisher. And uh, after that incredible ride by Eleanor Wiseman, doing the right thing, really. Joining up with Columbia, sitting on and waiting, timing her finishing sprint. I thought Columbia had it there in the end, Matt. But Wiseman just had that little bit left to come over the top of her, didn't she? Yeah, she certainly did. It was it was a tight one, and it was a long, drawn-out sprint. I don't think Columbia is necessarily the most explosive of riders, so rather than try and go from a slow speed, she just picked it up, and they're both at the very end. Bear in mind, they've been riding at threshold, so uh, in the end, it was Wiseman who just had enough in the tank to take the individual win, and 300 points for the team. Yep, yep absolutely. It was Mina Kuisinen, the Finnish rider for Toyota Elite, the final rider on the podium at the finish there. Zoe Langham coming through, looking stronger and stronger as the race went on for Wahula Colin, fourth place. And I was wrong. I need to make that very clear. I was totally wrong. Lou Bates didn't win everything, but she did win every ascent of Box Hill. She was sixth in the final sprint alongside Mary Wilkinson. Again, those two seemingly locked together in... Uh, locked together in Watts and Wheels, those two for Coalition Alpha in fifth and sixth, so more points for them as well. Uh, Hill, Soderstrom, Simench, and Gabby Guerra, who we were just hearing about in tenth 
place, sealing out that top 10. Look at the points as well. Still 175 points for Gabby Guerrero there in 10th place as well. And there are the points down to 20th as well. And they take us outside that leading group because Motas and Etienne uh, were hoovering up. I think it I think Motas was the first of those riders outside that leading group in that second group we saw come in as well. And you can see in amongst the points there as well, just how important it was to sprint out there, finishing places as well. Anything you've noticed in that top 10 there, Matt? Uh, no, I think uh, the, uh, there was a couple of riders that we haven't spoken about, and they were the ones that came first and second. So Wiseman and Colombi, yeah. you know, fortune favour the brave, but the rest of it were just the hitters that we know can perform over this distance. And of course, a big shout out uh, to Gabby Guerra as well. She'd be pretty happy with that. A lot to take from it as well, and a lot to take from it from us. I mean, it was. Uh, I think uh, as we were talking about um, the format, I think has worked. I think it's so great to have the to chop and change different formats, to get riders thinking differently, teams thinking differently, thinking outside the box and, and not always having something to look back on is a good thing in terms of uh, the way we move forward with this series. But uh, yeah, no doubt about the dominance of Coalition Alpha, but they had to work for it today. Uh, and it was a, a real entertaining proposition. Yeah, just looking down through riders from 21st down to 30th. Got your Paul was another of those a Coalition Alpha riders who was in that second group. Vicky Whitelaw right there in the middle of it as well. And of course, we saw Marine Mouget very active early on in the first few ascents of um, Box Hill. And in the end, she was 24th in that second group as well. And there it is down to 30th. Uh, Clutterbuck, I think, possibly the next of the Movistar riders behind Soderstrom as well. I should have looked on that page just before it. But uh, we are getting closer to being able to bring you the series points. And that's the one you're really going to be waiting for now as well. It'll come to us imminently while Matt and I watch yet another ascent of Box Hill up through the leafy trees blowing. And I think we're going to see some changes looking at the uh, the points that have been happening there as well. Because things were so close going into this evening between Hexagon, Aeonian and Coalition Alpha. And Aeonian have not had the best of nights either. They had a better final sprint there though as well. But... Hmm, it's going to be interesting to see where they slip because there were only tiny gaps between them, Matt. There were just nine points between our leaders, Coalition Alpha and Aeonian. Just five between Aeonian in second and Hexagon in third. And actually, Wahoo Lakal were only four points off the podium in fourth. I'm fairly confident in saying Wahoo Lakal are going to be moving up onto that podium. The question is, how far will Aeonian slip? Or will they? I am a mathematical numpty, as we all know, so I might be wrong. No. Sure, I'm yeah, sure I I think it's best that we, we wait until the official points, but no, I think you're quite right. What what it is going to make is there's no doubt about the dominance of Coalition Alpha. They're going to have to have an absolute nightmare of a final round to lose this. This is their series to lose. We know that. But certainly there is a real battle uh, and a realistic battle uh, that um, if, if one all you need is one bad night at the Zwift Grand Prix and you can you can lose yep. a lot of points and therefore runs are going to leapfrog over you. But yeah. I think, you know, once we get the final point score, Coalition Alpha will have moved clear even further. But Ionian, Exegon and Wahoo Lacol um, will be very, very close. And there's a bit of a drop off there. So the final spots on the podium moving into the final round next week um, are going to be, well, pretty tight. But hopefully we can get those points to you uh, very, very quickly. Yes. Now, next week, we'll just remind you, don't worry, don't go anywhere, folks, because hang in there. Wait to see the team score, because the team score is going to be the crucial thing in the Zwift Grand Prix going into that final round. But Matt's already mentioned it there. Next week's final round is definitely my favourite format, the Points Hunter. I'll remind you, this is the one whereby it's a points race just like tonight, except the big difference is every time you score any point, you are removed from the game. As an individual rider, you're gone. So you've scored. If you score a point, you've scored. That's what you've scored on the night for your team, and you are gone. And as we get further and further through the race, the uh, the number of points, sorry, the um, the total points that can be scored get higher. But you risk hanging on, getting dropped, and not scoring any points where you could have gone for some early points and get out of the game. So tactically, Matt, it is a, a mega. A mega one for the brain to try and work out, isn't it? And, and I'm pleased to say it's back in Yorkshire. The Royal Pump Room 8 is the uh, course for oh, next that's... week. I yeah, do like that yeah. course, yeah. No, it's a, it's a good, it's a, such a punchy course. I mean, uh, I, I, all the courses uh, that we have on Zwift that are used in the Zwift Grand Prix, where you can free ride as, as much as you want, have, have their own clear identity. But in terms of 
what I like. I, I like a punchy hard course and with not a lot of flat. That's where I, that, when I when I could ride well, that's where I'd, I'd go pretty well. And but I do like the Royal Pump Rooms course. It's uh, it's basically. Uh, that what it offers up is is the world championship course and every single permutation of direction you can go in. So you basically cover the whole course in its various permutations. Uh, oh, but there's hardly okay. a stretch of flat road at all. It's super punchy, <laughs> a lot of elevation and some steep long climbs on it. So um, it's a real racer's course. Um, but the teams yeah. are going to have to think long and hard about how they how they play it. Because as you said, once you've scored, you're out of the race. It's, uh, oh, I think we've got the team points ready, Jez. Right then, let's have a look at them. Here we go. This is points on the night. Coalition Alpha, as we said, having absolutely hammered it. 1,517 points for them. Ahead of Wahoo Lacole, who finished second on the night. Toyota Elite E-Cycling in third. I'm just checking my brains right. This is points on the night, isn't it? This is not overall just it yet. We'll be indeed. able to bring you that in just a moment. So, Toyota Elite E-Cycling in third on the night as well. Aeonian down in fourth. Hexagon did manage to do quite well in that final sprint in the end. They're in fifth place. No, Regardless of the fact that Mika Strodosom tried so hard to pick up as many points as she could on Box Hill, they are down in sixth place. Place, which is actually higher than their classification. So that might help them a little bit tonight. So does Drum again, their key player, 620, uh, sorry, 627 points for them. Uh, Team Castelli, elite, despite the fact that they had Sandrine Colombi in second place in that final sprint, still finishing in the top half in seventh. Saris Nopins, the team of our winner, of course, in eighth, ahead of next esports. Beast Mode, BR13, Rocker Corba, Abus Synergy down in 13th place, Swedish Swifters in 14th, Virginia's Blue Ridge 2024, we didn't mention them at all all evening, and we didn't really mention Primor either, unfortunately those two down in 15th and 16th place, but everyone battling, every one of the riders, particularly every one of the riders that finished within the time cut, well done to them, because that was an absolutely savage race. I think we can now bring you the team points based on that, the penultimate round going into the final round. Here we go. Coalition Alpha, of course, extending their lead, 155 points overall, having won tonight's round ahead of Aeonian, Wahoo Lacole. Let's look at the gaps between them. That'll be the interesting one to look at now, Matt. You're a far better mathematician than me, looking at what's closable and what can be done in that final round in the points under where, as I will remind viewers, there's an awful lot of opportunity for jeopardy. Hexagon, have Hexagon moved up? How many places have Hexagon? No, they're sorry. They started the day in third. They've dropped one to fourth. It's Wahoo Lacol who've now moved up into that top three. So the top two remain as they were, but a bigger gap between them now, between Coalition Alpha and Aeonian. It is Wahoo Lacol and Hexagon who've changed places. Wahoo Lacol now up on that podium. Toyota Elite E-Cycling in fifth. They've moved up two places tonight. Hats off to them. That's a great move. Getting closer to the podium as well. Let's see what they can do. A great ride by Toyota tonight. Two-place lift up into that top five. Fantastic. Virginia's, Virginia's Blue Ridge 2024 in sixth place. So they've dropped one tonight. Uh, Saris Nopins moving up one place from 8th to 7th after tonight's score. And Team Swedish Zwifters, where were they? Deary me. They've dropped from 6th to 8th, so not a great night for the Swedish team this evening. That's the top eight for you. Wow. Uh, Movistar in ninth, which I think is where they started. Yes, it was. It's where they started this evening. Next Esports were in 10th, and they finished. They're still in 10th now. Uh, Beast Mode and Aber Synergy have swapped places, so um, Beast Mode now just ahead of Aber Synergy, and they're ahead of Castelli, BL13, Rocker Corba Collective, and Primor RWB, who still sit on no points. I tell you what, Matt, I'm going to say it right now. I am absolutely behind the women in green, Primor RWA, Racing Without Borders, next week to score some points. I'm desperate for them to get off that Neil Poir point. So I'm all in for that, and I'm saying it right now. I really want them to get that next week. So come on, ladies, raise yourselves for that final race in the Points Hunter next week. There it is. And here's the men's and, uh, results as well. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Matt, for pointing. Matt, Matt do you want to run us through these? Because I've been walking. Yeah, I can. Mate, you, you'll, be, you'll be. 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 You'
So yeah, eight percent of you now with one round to go uh, still have a pretty decent lead. Eight percent today in front of Next Esports, but it's closed at the top, 138 to 143. So going into the final round, so it is Next Esports have closed up quite a bit after today. Uh, third place uh, by Wahoo Lacol, who moved up from fourth, dropping down from third to fourth. Coalition Alpha with 113. Toyota staying steady in fifth place there with 110. Exagon steady again in sixth with 96. Movistar, well, they've actually moved up from eighth place, now occupy seventh with 74 points and a singular point behind them, dropping down this week. Beast Mode powered by Rose with 73. So still pretty tight between the first two places. All it needs is a bad day for Abus and we could see teams moving up. The uh, Nether Reaches, this is Bill 13 in 9th, Team Swedish <laughs> Reaches in 10th, Saris No Pins in 11th, uh, Fudra Ponchures with 12th, Restart Powered by Alex Co coaching in 13th, 14th, Team Castelli Elite, Deepak Elite uh, in 15th with 9 points and at 16th, propping up the rest at the moment uh, with 8 points, that's Primo Race Without Borders in Sports. <laughs> Matt, thank you for bringing us your never reaches. Uh, sorry, nether reaches. I do like that. <laughs> oh, uh, thank you, everyone that's been watching all around the world to this, the biggest Zwift esports racing anywhere in the world. The best riders in the world right here in the Zwift Grand Prix. We have just seven days, six days, in fact, to wait until we bring you the final round. You will not want to miss the Points Hunter next week. It is epic. I absolutely love it. I love the smell of Jeopardy all around it in every one of those points. Let's see if our leading teams can hang on and who might surge to move up those rankings. Make sure you're with us. Do not forget, this is all teeing up everything that's going to happen in March in the Zwift games the biggest ever Zwift racing event it's going to be mega in March we're really looking forward to bringing it to you Matt Stevens thank you so much for your company and time again this evening cheers mate I've really enjoyed and it and I'll be I think I'll be with you again next week for the final mate absolutely I'm very much looking forward to it. I might be a little bit tired because I'm also doing commentary on the tour down under next week so I'll be a little bit tired but I'll be suitably pepped by the fact we've got the points hunter coming I'm really looking forward to that don't forget to join us next week folks it'll be similar timings to that you can follow it all on zwift.com thank you so much for your company from Matt Stevens and from me Jez Cox until next week's conclusion in the Zwift Grand Prix thank you and goodbye